okay, everybody, let's go. How did we get here? Uh, okay, so this is CF1. Um, we are particle-like dark matter. Um, and just very, very quickly, we had something like 150 LOIs submitted in the initial round of SOMAS. Um, that was a lot of community interest. It was actually the most of any CF topical group. Um, you are getting quieter and quieter, Hugh. I'm sorry. Oh, no. Maria Alana has a hand up, and I'm getting quieter and quieter, so I will speak closer to the microphone and take off my mask for that. Um, everybody on remotely should turn up their volume because there's a conflict between volume in the room versus volume remotely. Um, I'm going to keep going uh, and say we took these LOIs and we decided we needed to have some sort of organizing principle. And so we identified a few broad science themes that were split into eight big questions white papers, which were quote unquote solicited. Um, so these are these eight white papers. They are all now in the archive. Uh, I believe they can still be updated. Um, but of course, the time for updating those is getting very, very slim. And any updates that occur sort of after this week, next week is not guaranteed to percolate back its way up to the rest of SOMAS. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, but very, very briefly, the eight papers are dark matter direction to the neutrino fog, the landscape of low threshold dark matter direct detection in the next decade, Calibrations and backgrounds for dark matter direct detection, and then modeling, statistics, simulations, and computing needs for direct dark matter detection. So those four sort of combine to form direct detection needs, um, you know, sort of full mass range. Tracy has a comment. Yes, it fits into another dream of your case, which is when people are saying that it's hard for them to hear and suggest that if you go to your Zoom audio settings, We can't hear Tracy anymore. Yeah, I, I'm not. Um, can people on Zoom hear me at all with this mic? Uh, yes, but a little quiet. Okay, it's, um, they say it's still very quiet. Testing, testing again. Um, is this getting any better? It's the same. The, the issue is the, it's too loud in the room when it's quiet out remotely. That's the problem. That's you, you, you are very loud now. It's great. <laughs> okay, turning, testing, testing, testing. Wow, that's really sensitive. Um, we're going to stay here. How's that, Aaron? It's fantastic. Great. Okay, it's, again, we're having... People remotely, are your, your volumes all the way up on your computers because it's really loud in the room, right? And people don't want to be in this room if I'm yelling at them the whole time. <laughs> okay. We are going to proceed as best we can. Can you hear me remotely? Yes. Okay, thank you. And apologies for the sound. Uh, direct detection, dark matter is awesome, four papers. Uh, we also have some indirect detection papers, the landscape of cosmic ray and high energy photon probes of particle dark matter. Um, and I think sort of synergies between dark matter searches and multi-wavelength multi-messenger astrophysics. And then um, there's two other papers, one which was on puzzling excesses in dark matter searches and how to resolve them and ultra heavy particle dark matter. Again, I encourage people who have interest in these topics to, you know, certainly read the papers and give comments back to the authors. As I said, we can still take updates, um, but the window is, is closing rapidly. Um, there are also additional unsolicited white papers. I'm not going to go through them, but we just list them here to show that we, you know, we know what they were and we've tried to include them to the extent that we could in our report. Um, all right. 
<clears throat> so quick recap for what SNOMAS is going on. Um, there's a lot of CF1 pertinent sessions at SNOMAS. This, of course, is the first one um, today from 8.15 to 9, um, where we're going to try to discuss feedback and potentially organize teams for outstanding needs for our report. Um, tomorrow, there is a session on complementarity that's cross-listed with all many other frontiers. Um, tomorrow afternoon is one of the first Cosmic Frontier plenaries. Uh, Tracy will be giving a nice talk there about um, dark matter. Um, on Wednesday morning, there's the first of the all Cosmic Frontier discussions. And I think the idea there is that all of the Cosmic Frontier groups will be providing sort of a first look at their reports and seeking feedback. Um, and that will turn into a discussion session. Um, Thursday morning is a follow-up to that. I'm not entirely sure what the format of that is, but similar. Okay, uh, but similar. Um, so Wednesday and Thursday are gonna be the opportunities to continue providing feedback on our report, but also on the top level Cosmic Frontier report. Um, and then there's another colloquium um, Thursday evening or Thursday after Thursday evening. Um, then there's a few sort of uh, cross-listed things. There's an instrumentation uh, session Saturday morning um, and then a theory session also on Saturday morning. And then Sunday, there's more cross-listed things on high energy and ultra high energy astrophysical neutrinos. Okay. Um, question from Dan Acker in the room. Can you say where this is posted at these slides? These slides are not posted anywhere, <laughs> I don't think. We will post them. It'll be on the it'll be on the Twiki. I can also just send the link around right now to the Slack. How about I do that? Um, to the CF1 Slack. Okay. Uh, so um, the CF1 topical uh, question in the back. Yes, I can. Um, I imagine I have to do this slideshow. Okay. I, I'm always scared of doing that because I lose things like now, in fact. Oh my God. <laughs> That's as far as I'm going. Um, okay, I'm gonna, yeah, again, I apologize to people remotely. Please turn up your volumes. If we go the other way, then people in here are covering their ears because it's too loud. Um, Okay, uh, so we have a topical group summary report. Uh, the overleaf is linked up at the top right. We've been sharing it via email um, the last few, I guess, week or two. Um, and so that's the main thing we would like to talk about today. Uh, so maybe let's quickly go through some of our current top line messages that we are trying to get out of this report. Um, so first one is, I think, hopefully not controversial, particle dark matter is well motivated, um, theoretically. Um, and then a diverse portfolio of experiments and tools maximizes the possibility of discovering particle dark matter. So this provides motivation for experiments at various scales and level of technological maturity. Um, and then uh, to make a detection, you know, you have to understand how signals and backgrounds manifest in your detector. And so that leads to support for calibration, simulation, modeling um, efforts to really understand what we have got in a detector if we ever wanted to make a discovery. Um, and any, keep going. Um, okay, then we sort of split up into the two main thrusts of our section. There's indirect detection. And here what we've got to say is that it's wide ranging. Searches for dark matter throughout the cosmos, um, probing enormous time and distance scales in novel environments. Um, there's a rich signal space that are multi-messenger and multi-wavelength. And again, this sort of multi-scale program will both maximize sensitivity and confirm the robustness of any signal that comes through. Um, tools for discovery. To make the discovery, uh, this is part of the theme. You know, it's essential to characterize the systematic uncertainties as well as the backgrounds. Um, this is challenging, and currently these are the things that limit our sensitivity. Uh, but there are new ideas for experiments and methods and analyses. On the direct detection side, um, we want to sort of highlight some things. So 
Direct detection can be adapt bullet can respond to excess use and try to mitigate specific backgrounds. You can get built in cross checks for this way. It's model independent um, in the sense that it can search simultaneously for multiple potential signals. Uh, signatures, it's clean, the environment's configurable. It's sort of more agnostic to the particular model that you're testing. Um, for discovery, we need, again, support for simulations, modeling, calibrations, backgrounds. And then in prospects, the, the quote unquote G2 are currently in operation. Uh, next generation experiments have not yet started in the US. Um, and then in about a few years ago, there was this new initiatives in dark matter that provided a useful model for enabling future directions um, in the field. So uh, maybe I'll turn this over to Tracy uh, to talk about this slide. Okay, ah, uh, yes. Um, so maybe I'll go through this, and then I think on the next slide we have a set of questions which you give us, give us comments, okay? So um, great. So I will just say, so I'm giving, as she said, I'm giving a half plenary talk in the CS session tomorrow, which is about path to dark matter discovery. And one of the things that we were supposed to be do, doing is highlighting the CS1 and the Van Elster. Sorry, guys, you cannot hear. Uh, okay, sorry. T testing, can people online hear me? T Better now, thank you. Testing, okay. Um, okay. Can you put your mask on, please? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay. okay um, right. So, so I will be giving a talk tomorrow, which is past discovery and is meant partly to highlight the CS1 session. These are statements that I will be making in this talk. If you disagree with these statements, or I need to, or you want them to be fine-tuned, now would be a good time to know. So things I'm going to say are that mature direct detection technologies will probe orders of magnitude from the parameter space into the neutrino fire. And this is like a forecasting statement of what we would expect to see. Covering a range of highly motivated and parsimonious models, in particular classic WIMP, which are no more motivated. Um, that new technologies allowing detection of very low energy recoils will test new physical regimes and scenarios for dark matter production. That on indirect detection, photon and cosmic ray telescopes will have the capability to test thermorelic dark matter up to the unitarity bound and seek signals in new backgrounds for each channels. There is a relation, the question to the draft here from indirect detection people here. I named some in addition to just improving sensitivity to dark matter across the whole multi-wavelength and multi-magnitude range. I named some, some specific goals, including probing the thermal relic, closing the energy gap in sensitivity, and seeking the first intersections of low energy X nuclei. Um, if you think your experiment like doesn't fit into those, or there are other major goals that you want to talk about, like now is a good time to tell us. Um, a broader multi, this goes back to our other um, baseline messages, a broader multi-scale experimental program allows us to test many different scenarios to cross-check possible signals and to triangulate the properties of the dark matter in the case of a detection and support for theory and study of systematics backgrounds and calibration are going to be essential to understand the sequence of the experiment. So th those are basically, I mean, there was a lot more detail, of course, but those are my bottom line messages. Um, so, okay, so we have what, what, one more slide. And then uh, about the general GD message, and then we will ask for comments on these general messages, arguments arrived, bottom line, statements, uh, what you want to say. So on the direct detection message, we got a co some comments. So thank you for your feedback on um, how we were presenting the balance between large-scale experiments, small-scale experiments, and R&D. We are advocating for a multi-scale program, but an example comment here was that we had maybe overweighted the smaller experiments in R&D relative to large experiments. There was a comment that the text is in danger of making the pursuit of direct dark matter detection sound like a cross between a rolling R&D program and a range of small-scale experiments. Can we try to get a more appropriate emphasis on the large-scale program? Um, so, you know, we, we would like to use this session partly to brainstorm a little bit on what this message could be and on how we should, you know, both have, like support for the large-scale next generation G3 experiments to drill deep, support for mechanisms to enable a small-scale program and support of simulations, backgrounds, calibrations, and things that enable a discovery. So some example wording starting from a suggestion by Raphael Lang was to address this grand challenge, we must employ multiple experimental techniques spanning the entire range of the HEP program, including both direct and indirect detection techniques. Moderate and large scale experiments drill deep in a particular DM scenario such as WIMPs where a small scale experiments improve our versatility and ability to test the broader energy recoil. So that's kind of where we are in terms of the feedback we've received, um, what we're thinking about, what we're doing. Now I would like to stop and say, okay, 
are these the right messages that we want to emphasize? Are there things here that you disagree with that you think we need to look at? And are we missing important elements? And um, yeah, and I guess now, now would be a good time to take comments and questions. To the uh, one, unless I missed it, maybe one thing to try to add to the message is also the connection with with the other frontiers, in particular the energy frontier. Uh, okay, but also um, heavens and coherent. Uh, neutrino detection. So there's, um, I wonder if it's a paragraph outlining how all the various ones, uh, especially technologies developed for dark matter are used in many, many other fields as well. One quick comment from uh, Christian. I think uh, in, as we said in the last meeting, it would be helpful to emphasize the next generation, even the very broad international basis on which uh, the next generation will happen as opposed to the G3 language. In much the same way that uh, overall, uh, there's an emphasis about how SNOMAS supports experiments, uh, how theory supports experiments. I think it would be valuable to stress the ways in which astrophysical uncertainty are limiting our ability to interpret dark matter detection experiments and urge the need to, for example, I was thinking of the work of Ina Nesset and um, Mariangelo De Santi is really important in defining how well do we know the dark matter effect. So to not mention that aspect at all seems important. I will say there's a like, large section of this in the report, and this is one of the things that we mean when we talk about systematic backgrounds and that we talk about systematics and background modeling that needs to be more explicit. Okay, we still have questions in the room. If you are remote, um, can some... Yeah. Okay, well, I'll come back here. Yes. Hello. Okay. So, quick question. When we talk about things like we probe thermal dark matter up to 1 keV, do we take into account the velocity dependent cross sections versus independent cross sections or spin dependent versus independent limit? Tracy, do you want to answer that or I can comment? Okay. So uh, we we have, I, I guess, you can comment on the direct detection stuff is independent. For, uh, I think in direct detection, we show multiple cases. For indirect detection, and this will come up later, we don't actually currently have a summary figure showing like detailed sensitivity. Um, this may be a thing, we, this is probably a thing we need to fix. Um, but we, uh, we don't have a lot of, we, we have discussion about like uncertainties in the velocity distribution of dark matter, but not a ton about um, how velocity dependence would affect it. You can add. I'll maybe make a general comment that at some level, the details are less important than the overall message. So I, I think, you know, what I think I would like to talk about here is, you know, the statement that we want a broad program that has a big experiment or two that goes deep we have small scale experiments that go wide, however we're defining that, plus R&D to support the next generation of types of experiments and also support for simulations, calibrations, that type of stuff. That's the message that we're proposing. And I would like to get feedback on that um, particularly. And then, you know, I think the details of, are we crossing a particular location? You know, we can, we can punt to later um, when we're looking at figures and things. Um, so I have a question from Ben, question from Prisca. Anybody online at the moment that we can put in the queue? Um, and then Sean after Prisca. Here's Ben. 
So the, the one thing I want to say is as far as the R&D goes, we need to make sure that there's R&D for beyond G3, right? There's compelling region, there's compelling theories below the neutrino fog that large noble PPCs will never reach. If we want to start getting there after the G3 program, we need to do R&D for beyond G3 now, not just R&D for BMNI type experiments. Thank you, Ben. Um, going back to Priska. Thanks. Um, words matter a lot, and I'm wondering if we're brave enough to use Raphael's slogan in this. Um, I would like to use that. Raphael's slogan was drill down, drill deep, prospect wide, right? And we actually did use some of that language in a paragraph, but then realized that it didn't quite work. <laughs> so we changed the language a little bit, but I. I'm yeah. I mean, drill down, drill deep, prospect wide could be a the CF1 slogan. Um, think about it. I'm going to go to Sean, who had his hand up earlier. Hey, so I wanted to ask uh, for the discussion of direct detection. There's some mention of you know the usefulness of multiple technologies, but do we want to include an explicit statement about you know we want at least, you know, we need at least two experiments probing any mass range or something, or, you know, more than just, you know, the complementary that we'll need the backup and, and support for that. Um, so let me, there's the question, do we want to be explicit about wanting multiple techniques probing the same region of space? Tim Tate. And again, people who are remotely, you know, certainly raise your hands if you have a question. So, I mean, speaking to the point about multiple technologies. Sorry about that. Anyway, speaking to the point about multiple technologies, I think that we should point out the advantages of having multiple experiments. And you know, if we don't want to be as strong as to say that we need them, we should definitely point out where they will help us. And we know that the physics case is very strong. You can really narrow down parameters much better if you have two different targets and you can see signals in them. Um, the other thing I wanted to add is that I think some of the things I'd like to see in the figures as far as messaging goes include something like well-motivated targets. I think that we need to send the message that there's interesting stuff there. And even if we want to be very clear that it's not all of what's interesting, but just say there's an example of something that's interesting. Uh, I'm sitting here next to Priska. She and I worked on the CF1 report from last NOMAS, which was about direct detection of dark matter. And we had very cartoonish targets, but they got used over and over again to justify what we wanted to do. And I think that having something specific so that the person who doesn't know the field looks at it and says, look, these guys are going to get here, and there's, this is a good thing to do, it sends a message that's really important. Thanks, Tim. We have Lauren, yeah. So I'm sorry it's hard to hear, and I think Tim may have said something along the lines of what I was just about to say, which is just... I mean, in terms of feedback for just this slide that's labeled DD message, you're missing your science goals here. So it just has, okay, we want to, I, I mean, I agree that we, we certainly want to have this broad approach, right? And I think the message is here in your slides, but it's just not in this succinct statement. Like, I think you want to say, we want to probe down to the neutrino fog, like what mass, frame, like just some, as as you expect, like cartoonish thing, but you you need at least just some basic science goal as part of your bottom line message. Is just what I would say. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, question in the room. Uh, Pat Harding. Um, I I just wanted to say, uh, you you do a pretty good job of balancing direct detection with indirect detection currently. But I, I feel like there should be some extra emphasis on this, especially given uh, Andrew Langford's point yesterday that indirect detection is currently completely unfunded in the next generation. Uh, 
just to clarify, do you want us to put more weight on indirect detection or put more, or just make sure that we very explicitly say both direct and indirect detection? I, I think the combination is, is worthwhile, but it's, it's worth explicitly saying that, you know, direct detection without indirect detection is significantly weaker. Marcelli, no. Okay, apparently only people can hear me, so really shove the mic into your mask when you speak to it and keep your mask on, that way we don't contaminate each other, but I don't know, that's the best I think we can do. Um, and, and speak loudly into the mic, I guess. Okay, that's a lot of comments that we just got. Um, Tracy, I'm sure, has got them all captured. <laughs> um, okay, so in the chat, there's this comment that figure 12 proposes or presupposes that dark matter is a single particle um, and that multi-component dark matter are more general, um, worth emphasizing the proposed experiments could cover more complex dark sectors. I do think that's something actually that Tracy will explicitly be sort of going through in her talk tomorrow, but maybe in the report we could be more com uh, explicit about that. Yeah, I, I, I will maybe just comment on this. Yes, indeed, when I, when I give my talk tomorrow, it's a three, at least three component dark sector and, we'll talk, and I'll talk about that. Um, that said, my personal feeling is that for the key, for the summary figures, like we can definitely talk about this in the report, in the report but my personal feeling is that for the summary figures, we, we should focus on the case where there's one particle and it's all the dark matter, just, just because I, I think that making those figures dramatically more complicated will make them less useful. You know? So that would, that would be my personal feeling. But, but it can certainly be something we discuss. I would agree with that inclination. I, I am at a point where simplifying the message is the is the best thing. We have to distill it to, again, the single plot or the single three bullets that end up in the top line reports. Um, so all the details are important to us, but when we're presenting outside, I, we really, to me, have to be punchy. Um, Dan Acker in the room. I saw there was a hand online which has gone down. Um, so I'll assume that's gone for now. I don't know if this comes as a later part of this discussion, but I think it's it's natural when we come together to, you know, we're trying to write down the sum of our dreams and, you know, everyone is speaking to their, you know, the interests of what they would like to pursue and make sure there's buy-in within the room. We we I think we want part of the message to be why the rest of the community should want our dreams to come true, right? And I think we need to try to articulate what, you know, what a discovery or what, hopefully not just more limits, brings to the rest of the field. I mean, Hitoshi did this amazing synthesis yesterday. I think there's a lot of strong messages there that we could draw from and try to incorporate. Thank you, Dan. Maybe I'll make another sort of general comment, um, which is also about the larger field. So, you know, I've been using this, these world clouds a little bit and talks I've been giving where dark matter was the number one most comment, most used topic in all of the LOIs across all the frontiers. Um, so a thing that I think would be wonderful if dark matter comes out of this whole snow mass process as the priority or certainly a high priority in a way that it, you know, in the sense that yesterday we saw that, you know, the LHC was the near-term priority of P5, and Dune LBNF was the mid-scale priority of P5. I would like dark matter to come out as the priority of the next P5, right? And that, I think, based on the interest, not just in this room, but throughout the whole you know, high-energy physics community, is a possibility. And if that happens, then it's Cosmic Frontier's place in that larger picture of dark matter being the thing that particle physics is trying to understand that we would want to also be sort of positioning ourselves within. So keep that in mind when you're talking to your friends and colleagues and us. Um, Th thanks very much everyone on Zoom and in the room for these excellent comments. Um, I think it might be good to then move on to the remaining slides where we wanted to ask for feedback specifically on figures and ideas for new summary figures that are needed. So, do you want to? Yeah. Uh, 
So what I'm so well, you, you'll see if you agree with what I'm about to say. All right. So it has been conveyed to us that the and here this is somewhat intuitive as well. The informative summary figures are the elements of our report that are most likely to get up to the Cosmic Frontier report and eventually the Snowmass report. Like these are most likely to propagate into widely seen ports. Okay, so some informal feedback that we got from the CS conveners, and, and I guess again, inform more, more formally from Chris, was just that you know the figures are important. For indirect detection, we need some kind of summary sensitivity figure, which we currently do not have. And we're not already present. It would be good to, con this is what Tim said, it would be good to consider adding some benchmark models to demonstrate sensitivity. So the questions that I would like people to think about for the remaining 20 minutes are like, what figures are missing from our report? Like, what, what do we just like, we don't have and it needs to be there? What in the existing figures needs to be improved? And what, if any, benchmark models would we put? I am going to suggest that um, we take off advantage of, of Snowmass and of the Slack channel to try to do like refinement of the figures, not just in this session. I would like people to, ideally, I would like us to sort of form working groups to refine, and some of that activity has already been going on in the Slack channel. So I'm not looking at the, I think we're not looking at the moment for comments like, um, this shade of blue is aesthetically unpleasing, right? So, like, I mean, that's, we, we absolutely should try to make the figures pretty, but we can do that on Slack, right? Like, we've got 20 minutes. Yeah. So I'm looking more for sort of more big picture comments about, like, we don't have a figure that demonstrates X. Or, or maybe things like, these two figures really should be one to one. Or that, or, you know, this figure sends totally the wrong message, okay? So with that said, with that in mind, I want to just quickly, like, skim through the figures that are currently in the report, and, I, and rather than like ask for input on each one individually, I'm going to just go through each one and then ask for feedback on each one. Okay. Uh, if, if we have time, I would love to do working group assignments here. If not, I would strongly encourage everyone to get onto the Slack channel and, and we'll try to set up like sort of like little parallels or little Slack channels where people can form into groups and, and assign to each other. Okay. Well, I'd love to do it here, but I just don't know if we're going to have time. Slack, Slack channel is good. Everyone should be on the CF1 Slack channel if you're interested in contributing to these figures at all. All right. So, um, so the first figures that we have are figure two. So figure one and figure two are showing a timeline of future indirect detection experiments, which can turn out this is not the case of mine. Um, we have uh, sub, sub figures for gamma rays at different energies, x-rays and cosmic rays sorted by um, basically like, is it, has it already happened? Is it funded and going to happen? Uh, figure three is a sort of general cartoon for direct detection of kinds of types of models that we might consider going after as a function of dark matter mass and interaction strength. Um, figure four, this has already had quite a lot of discussion on Slack. I very strongly encourage you to join that discussion if you're interested. This is, um, for, so, so this is the summary figure for dark matter nucleon scattering and dark matter collision. Um, figure six is focusing on dark matter electron and dark matter nucleon scattering and, and absorption in um, low threshold experiments. And we sort of have some figures here. Figure seven, uh, and this is again from the from white papers from now, so this is white papers one and two. Uh, from our figure seven comes from our white paper on ultra heavy dark matter. And as you can see is again, scattering cross section versus mass scale, but now extending up to the mass scale. And figure eight is a, uh, is, is a forecast showing uh, how the sensitive, well, a history in a forecast showing how the sensitivity of the large um, xenon experiments has developed over time. So that's, what we currently have for figures. I'm happy to go to any one figure in particular if people have general comments, but I would like to ask for input now on these general questions. Are we, like, what are we missing? What are places where there is a, not um, aesthetic, but like conceptual interest in what we need to make? And what ideas do people have for benchmarks? Have you given some requests for theory benchmarks? Question. 
Yeah, I was just going to comment on, on figure three. Um, is there a reason why sort of current limits are not on figure three? Or some cartoon of current limits, something that just sort of gives an idea. Yeah, so I, I think we were thinking of this theory more just sort of like theory motivation to show how the space is populated and then put the constraints in other plots. But um, but yeah, I mean, we, we could think of that. There should be some kind of constraint on this slide. I don't know, Kira, if you want to talk about this. I, mean, I guess it depends what we're trying to do with each figure. Um, so this, is this, this is not, in my mind, the benchmark figure, right? We, I think that we're talking about putting the benchmarks on the limit plots, maybe. Um, I'm very conflicted on what to do with theory, actually. I think if Tim has a thought, I have a thought first, uh, that I, I want, you know, we want to show that this is theoretically well motivated, which it is, and that that is a hugely important statement to make, um, but no individual you know, so th so the cartoon is good because it's not trying to pull out individual you know models. It's saying broadly, this is like the class that we're looking for, and I don't know. Maybe I'll just meander into dust and give it to Tim. Uh, thank you. So, my thought was maybe actually what you want to do is instead of leading with figure three, lead with figure four. So you show actually what the ex experimental prospects and uh, progress is, and then go to the theory figure, but put the experimental, you know, just replicate figure four on top of it. So the emphasis is different and that way, I, I understand actually why you're conflicted and I feel the conflict too, but I think putting the two together sends a message that's much more powerful than having them separate. Um, we have a comment in the back from Ben, then I'll come back to Prisco. Yeah, so just, um, to, to, to say some of the, the difficulty we've been having with trying to put this benchmark model on figure four, uh, when we were assembling white paper one, we, we, you know, we did a survey of the, the well-motivated theories that still exist. And basically they cover the entire figure. Uh, and so unless you wanna start picking and choosing and playing favorites, saying here's the benchmark region is basically just shading the entire figure in. Um, so, yeah, that, that's kind of the difficulty. Do we play favorites so that we can put something on there? Uh, th th there there's nothing that just stands out as a benchmark model at this point. I feel like that might get a response from some people. Um, Priska, you had a question before. Do you want to continue this particular response? Okay. So, I mean, that's, of course, a good point, and it's an important point. Uh, if you, Yeah, if you have... If you kept the shading that's on the current figure three, then at least it would be distinguished by classes of models. And so it, it wouldn't just, because I agree that shading the entire figure tells nobody anything and will make you know, no impression. But showing that there's a bunch of different theoretical uh, models that you can actually probe you know, in different regions of the parameter space, I think that does send an important message, even if they do cover all of it. Just a couple uh, comments. One is that, of course, with these hard edges, it looks like there's all this white space where there aren't any, <laughs> which is obviously not true. Um, on the other hand, if you want to make this not say that, then you need shading that kind of just, you know, has a gradation. And at that point, it becomes far too complicated to put it on figure four. In any case, it doesn't really that then elevates nuclear recoiling dark matter uh, above, I mean, it's, it, it really, um, I understand the motivation, but um, I kind of like having something which tells people all the different spaces where something can be found. And to well motivated, I feel this one is just a little too harsh, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Thank you, uh, we have a question, go first, okay. My suggestion is this um, coming coming from CF2, I look at this plot and it just doesn't have a lot of context to me. So something that just says sort of where we are currently, it, it can be just sort of a cartoon van or something that says, you know, are are the current limits, you know, 20 orders of magnitude above the plot or you know, where where are we on this? 
So that was my quick one. Thank you. Okay, we can we can try that. It's very sensitive. This is a okay. I've turned up the volume a little, with really the tiny amount, and it's okay. Amazing. Well, I'm glad we figured that out in the last ten minutes. Uh, here, a question from the room. I I think I'm outside the field, but uh, it, so so I. I just say an outside perspective that I see here is that I don't understand from these figures what fraction of well motivated theory space you expect to exclude or see in the next decade or two. If you can get find a figure that gets that message across that'd be really awesome. Thank you very much for that comment. Um, all right, Rick in the chat asks, are we confident that technology can really deliver the currently funded region. Um, and then there's some extra stuff. Um, so this is, I think this is more about the details in the back end, which maybe you should go into the Slack with Ben about what experiments go into each particular version of the, of the curves. Um, so we'll record that question for later. I thought I saw a hand in the room. I do. So if figure three is to be kept, then I see NMFFM, but I don't see anybody else. So uh, any other SUSY models, right? So that's that's one of the things that I would look for if I'm looking for that plot. So why NMFFM is the favorite one, I don't know. Second, small question, but why axis just says dark matter interaction strength? I don't know what that is. Is it a self-interaction strength? Is it an interaction strength with a nucleus? Is it an annihilation cross-section? It's, it's a bit unclear at the moment. And the third, if we are talking about hidden sectors, across 20 years, different people use hidden sectors. And at the moment, I don't know if we all mean the same thing. So it could be a good idea for all of us to supplement on that. That last point may be something that comes up tomorrow in the complementarity section, um, but that's a good question that we do all to say hidden sectors freely. Um, thank you. Uh, Rick asked which Slack. It's the the main CF1 Slack channel in in Snowmass. Um, I can make sure you know about it after the or have the link afterwards. Question in the back, and still no other questions online that I can see. Uh, maybe just a comment on that missing figure for combining uh, sensitivity for indirect detection. Uh, there was some uh, dis discussions going on, but. Uh, one of the challenges is that different instruments are sensitive to different mass ranges and different models. Uh, so combining them might diffuse the advantage of each instrument, but there is some discussion going on and working towards making some plots along that line. But some reference, representation of indirect detection in the uh, main paper will be very helpful to the community of gamma ray. Thank you for that. Uh, maybe I'll respond in the moment to something you said about the advantages of various technologies. And I just, I think we're not at a state in this point where we are really trying to pull out advantages of one technology versus another. Um, you know, I, I guess the, the messages from yesterday that resonated a little bit with me about, um, you know, the, the shooting out versus shooting in versus not shooting at all, um, or otherwise, bickering scientists get no funding. Um, we, we, I, and I don't want to give the sense that all technologies are equal, because I certainly have my own preferences. Um, so that balance is really difficult to strike between pushing the, you know, rising all boats versus, you know, advocating for the thing that you're most interested in. Um, again, that comment is not going to help anybody do that either. But just, you know, we have to be conscious of that, that I think, I think the balance in this particular presentation, in this particular report is, the field, all the technologies, trying to make sure that we gain as much support broadly as opposed to this technology versus that technology. And, and doing that in a nuanced way is very challenging, I understand. I mean, I'm acutely aware of it, trying to do it. Um, OK, Tracy. We've got five minutes to the end. Um, and then I guess we'll switch over to CF2, which is next in this uh, same room. So um, I think maybe at this point, oh, we have a raised hand, sorry. Um, 
Hey, no problem. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, just a high level comment um, question, page 19 in the report, navigating the neutrino fog. Um, I think it's obvious to all the experts who work in the field that this is this is sort of the target for the next decade, you know, getting to this. It's not obvious from the way the report's written, though. You know, and I think everyone also understands that getting through that somehow, if indeed we have to, requires something like directional detection. And again, that connection is not at all clear the way the document's phrased. I don't know if we need to do that, but I, I if a smart and inquisitive person outside the field looks at this, they're going to sort of wonder if we have a plan. Uh, yeah, that, that, make that does make sense. That couples a little bit to Lauren's earlier comment, too, about having science targets explicitly called out. And, and it is true that the message right now is rather vague on what we're trying to do in, in the sort of explicit science sense, like a sensitivity. Um, that was sort of deliberate initially. We could go back and look at how to craft that message a bit better, I think, given that comment. I'm gonna give it back to Tracy. Yeah. Um, okay, so, sorry. I had a comment about author lists for this summary paper and in general for all the white papers because we haven't used this a consistent uh, criteria. So the WP4 had uh, endorsers and everybody who wanted to be an author, we added them as author. Other of the uh, solicited white papers had like five authors. And in the summary white paper, you know, I open it and it has four authors and I was looking at the old one it had 30 and looking at four people that signed the paper in 10 years from now, we will be for these four random people who like, so I was wondering, should we, should we make it broader? Should we use the editor, add the editors of the, of the contributor page? I don't know how to do it, but can we make it such, can we make it look like it's a community document? So I think there was some discussion about this at the cosmic frontier level. Our feeling was that, you know, whatever is done, it would be best if it was done consistently across the cosmic frontier. So people don't try to do this exercise of like, oh, CF1 has a hundred people signing it. The CF2 only has six people signing it. You know? um, so the, the last I saw on the Slack channel, the cosmic frontier conveners were recommending like not having endorser lists, but I think this is a discussion that can continue. Tim, I don't know if you want to say. Yeah, okay. So yeah, I, I guess, so okay, this, this was something that we were thinking about in an earlier stage, like having, I think, a place to, to sign up for people who did that. The thing is like, we don't want to put people's names on this without their consent, obviously. Um, yeah. But okay, that's, that's a good point, thanks. All right, um, we're basically, Oh, sorry, Eric, uh, please go ahead and then you may have to stop. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I just wanted to say as we wrap up, you know, the, listening to this and, and listening to Prisca's earlier comment, I, I really feel like Raphael's language, dig deep, prospect wide, captures a lot of what we're trying to say about how rich the science opportunities are and how broad the scope of what we can do here is. And showing that broad and rich scope, I think is going to be the key to getting more of the dark matter money coming into CF, so. I'll say just as an example, some people in our group didn't like, di didn't, didn't feel like prospect as a verb conveyed something to, to them. Like, I, like, I mean, just like at the level of language and slogans, like this was an issue, like people said prospect wide and feel like that the prospect's a noun, not, not a verb. And I'm like, no, and you know, like it's, it's a verb as well, but there's, I, I'm just saying that like at, at the level of language, there were people who at that point was like, "I don't know what you mean." I think for 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 those of us who've spent the last twenty years in mines, it's a very yeah. vivid image that. That's it right, but maybe not so much for people in other fields who haven't spent the last twenty years in mines. So yeah, but 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 thanks. That's good. okay. I think we need to hand over to CF two. I guess what what I would ask is for the people who um people who want to actively work on improving the figures or on creating new figures, please join the CF1 Slack channel if you're not already on there. And in particular, since we're trying to create this indirect detection figure from scratch, um, 
I will likely send a message on the Slack channel, but if you were interested in getting involved in, uh, put, in putting that figure together, uh, please email me or ping me on Slack and let me know that you were a volunteer for this. And I will, um, I, I will try to coordinate something since we are out of time to try to coordinate something in, in this meeting. Do you, I don't know if you have any last comments. I have no last comments. <laughs> I'm coughing on my mask. Um, no, thanks everybody for coming. Obviously that was very, very rushed and a little chaotic. Um, we're going to do the best we can to incorporate comments, feedback, text. I think the, the document is still living, so um, we might have a working session while we're here, and we'll try to tell people about that. Um, and anyway, thanks everybody for participating. We really appreciate it. I don't know who's taking over. Okay. Bring your computer and it's going to be fun. It, it seems to be that CF2 has the same Zoom as CF1. Yeah, I think we're in the same Zoom. Yeah. Okay. But I need my computer. No. I was just checking. Gray should be there, Hugh. Look for Gray. But you can grab your computer either way. All right, take your computer. <clears throat> Hi, Yor. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I hope everybody so else I think can we're just as well. waiting for the people in the room. Yeah. I see some familiar CF2 like names beginning to show up. Yeah. And friends continuing on from CF1. Yeah. No, I guess they are now trying to plug in Gray's, Gray's computer. <laughs> Ah, I think I see gray, at least the computer. That's that. <clears throat> hello, hello, hello. All right, it's working. Yep, so you sound pretty good to us, Gray. 
Do we sound okay to you? We can hear you. Maybe. Not, uh, that was not con entirely convincing. <laughs> Lindley, please talk a bit. Hey, Gray, how's it going in the room? So loud. <laughs> so this was the issue they were having in CF1. All right, so, so an absolute disaster. I went to the AV training and none of this was in the AV training. So yeah, I, I thought I really knew I was what I was coming into. All right, say something again. Hi, Gray, how's it going? Perfect, perfect, too loud? Okay. Okay. But there's no video yet, I think, from the room. I think that's okay. The video wasn't that important from want the some, last. You want some slide. video? We get, all right, how about now? Can you hear Lindley now? Can you guys hear me? All right. Okay. So you, you so is, is the deal is you want to see the room, Jorg? I was just thinking it was the same before. It's not super important. If, if it works, yeah. it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. You see uh, him? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, there's no point in me sharing screen because, Lindley, you've got slides, right? Yes. I made some slides for the group. So are we ready to go? Yeah. Welcome, everyone, to the CF2 meeting. I'm, I'm the person on the ground. Lindley will be the true host and take it away, Lindley. Sounds good. Actually, you are, could I put you to work taking some notes for us? Yeah, I can do that. Do that. Thanks, York. Excellent. Okay. So let me go ahead and play and see if my share still works. Okay. Can you guys still see the slide, uh, slides? Yes. Great. Okay, all. So welcome to CF2, Wave Like Dark Matter. I hope this is where you want it to be. I am Lindley, one of your CF2 conveners. Gray, you can say hi. Hi. I, somewhere they're <laughs> captioning. I don't know how to put it on this screen. I hope if you need it, the, yeah. you, the, there's a better way. Sounds good. Uh, and recording is on and closed captioning is on. So those must be going somewhere. <laughs> Excellent. And then our last CF2 convener is Jorg. Jorg, you want to say hi? Hi. Hello. Okay. Um, so for everyone out there, I sent out an email to the CF2 email list on Friday with the draft report, along with a Google Doc for putting high level comments. Um, I have to admit that the Dark Matter New Initiative review really set both Gray and I back. So the document is not as well edited as we would like. So today, and in general, what we're really looking for is whether you agree with the high level message that we're trying to transmit for the community. Does everyone in the room agree with that? <laughs> and does everyone on Zoom, though I can't see because I'm sharing? Okay. Gray, do we have some agreement from the room? The, the, some vague nods. Are you, are you asking okay. that they agree with the message already or they agree that the purpose of this meeting is to figure out if they agree with the message? The purpose of the meeting. <laughs> okay, so that's a pretty low, a pretty small ask. Yes, yes. And now we are going to present um, how we've come to understand the message from the community and hopefully you guys agree. So the slides I'm sharing are a rough draft of what I would like to present CF wide. And the last two slides are very much a work in progress, um, but we'll take it away from here. So CF2. So first, where did we start from? So wave-like dark matter, the definition is masses less than one EV. And you can work through this if this makes sense, uh, you know, as far as occupation numbers and wavelength, you have a real wavelength. The broad candidates can be directed into three areas, the pseudoscalar, the scalar, and the vector. The production in this area is all sort of athermal. Um, and so you're not worrying about any thermal processes um, and sort of the main model is sort of a misalignment mechanism. And if you're looking at wave like dark matter, the detection always involves some sort of coherent interaction of the wave with your detector and some sort of resonant amplification is going to be needed to see this very small signal. And of course, like the most famous candidate in this group is the QCD axion, but it's not the only one. And that's where we're starting from. So why wave like dark matter? At masses less than one EV, particles cross that wave particle divide and start behaving as waves. 
The detection techniques are inherently quantum. I hope you guys got that from the write-up as one of the things we're trying to emphasize. Um, and one of the other things we're trying to emphasize is that the detection techniques are going to change as a function of frequency. So there isn't one experiment you can do. You're going to have to do a suite of experiments. And you can build some intuition from sort of electromagnetic radiation in that the way you detect radio waves is different than how you detect ultraviolet light. Um, and so you're going to need different techniques as you go up in frequency and the same is true for waves like dark matter. And so one of the key technologies is sort of this moving beyond the standard quantum limit in your amplification of the system. And this too, as you move in frequency, how you beat the limit and push the noise into different observables is going to require different devices. And so that's what you're seeing within this community is that you're going to need a suite of techniques to get at the full spectrum of wave like dark matter. So why now? Why are you hearing a lot about waves like dark matter? Well, we're a growing community and we're growing because there's been advancements in cryogenics, magnets, and quantum sensing coupled with better theoretical understandings of the cosmologies of wave like dark matter. And it's really led to an explosion in this community. And this is a plot that John Ouellette makes of like the number of APS abstracts. And like for the last few years, we've been tying the WIMP community, which is pretty good for kind of this growing community. I'll, I'll inject Lindley that the, the room crowdedness, we have people sitting on the side of the windows just like in CF1. So it's the, the room room. Oh, doing line. good. So thanks. If, if someone could grab a picture, that would be nice for the rest of us on Zoom. So, um, so as you all know, that have been sort of really in the mix of what CF2 has been doing, um, we wrote two community white papers. Um, and, you know, sort of as the conveners, we've distilled this down into two community goals. One goal is to do a definitive search for the QCD axion. And the other goal is to pursue a theory and RUD program to elucidate the opportunities in scalar and vector dark matter. And so as a community of wave like dark matter, that's the first thing that we're putting forward to you all today is those are our two community goals. And the community goals are followed up by our community roadmap. And these are building very much on our community white papers. And so, you know, our roadmap goes as follows, pursue the QCD axion by executing our current experiments. So ADMX G2 um, is continuing its scan. And we have the first two DMNI, these dark matter new initiative programs, DM radio cubic meter and ADMX EFR that are ready to start executing their project plans. And we're just ready, waiting to get that money to do construction. <laughs> Um, the next part of our roadmap is that we're going to need a collection of small scale experiments. Um, and so this requires a pot of money for small scale projects. And this DOE DMNI project seems to work well, that we identified two projects that were ready to go. Um, and they're, you know, formed their projects and are ready to start building. We need to do that now. Um, we need to continue to do that and keep that sort of uh, flagship pro projects going. We need to continue to support enabling technologies, especially cross-disciplinary collaborations. And so that's another um, um, uh, you know, key part of our roadmap. And then the last part is a strong theory program, support theory beyond the QCD axion into scalars, vectors, and ALPs, both cosmology and astrophysics um, going forward. So for everyone in the room, that is the executive summary from the report. <laughs> And the most critical thing um, that we need to get right, because everyone is going to, not everyone, a lot of people will read the executive summary, a much fewer number will read the rest of the report, and even fewer will then move over into our community white papers. And so- hey, Lindley, can, um, I, go off, can I go off script for a moment? Yeah. Because I've got, I've got people in the room. I mean, you're not in the room, but I, I actually do kind of want to do a, a totally informal non-binding straw poll. So who here has what they consider a, a current, current like, you know, small mid-scale project going on for the QCD axion? Okay, so that's, a, that's, that's, that's the, the small section. Who here has, wants to see their small scale experiment funded in a, like a DM&I style process? Is that, yeah, Raphael, you do. Yeah, okay. All right, yeah, Stefan, I, I know, all right, look, yeah, there's, there's, okay, all right. So who here is working on some sort of weird quantum detection technology that's going to improve sensitivity? Yeah, okay, good, Aaron, thank you. <laughs> All right, and who's, who's, who's either working on or wants to see kind of the next killer app for wave-like dark matter theory, you know, the next QCD axion? Is anybody doing that theory? Yeah, okay, we got a few. So what, what about the rest of you? There's a whole bunch of you didn't raise your hands. Are you just in general agreement with this or have you got something else that's, that ought to be here? 
maybe we'll maybe we'll talk about that when we do questions at the end. I just I kind of wanted to see if that what this is. I only got a few hands for each of these, Lindley. So I wonder if there's anything missing. Anyway, sorry, please go on. Right. And so at this point, I would mention that Gray, York, and myself introduced ourselves at the beginning. Um, we are on Slack. We have email. Um, so if you want to send us comments, please do. We also have that Google Doc um, that we send out to gather questions. <laughs> I like the chat in general agreement as a theorist. Excellent. Okay. So then, Lindley, do you want to take the, questions now, or do you want to do you want to get to the end and do them at the end? Um, so if everyone would be okay, I would like to kind of go through some of the the slides, kind of maybe flip through them that I would wanted to show at the CF Y meeting to try to explain our science, um, and then let's go back to this community roadmap and our goals. Does that sound okay to everyone? Yeah. Great. Cool. So then I wanted to say a little bit about what the QCD axion is when we're talking to the bigger community. And something we need to get polished is sort of the complementarity. So this, uh, so one of the big points if you're talking about the QCD axion is the cup, is the connection to sort of introducing heavy quarks with KSBZ or additional Higgs fields. Um, and so then trying to make an image of what the definitive axion search goes, this is, um, a version of our GA gamma gamma plot that um, Asher uh, very kindly made for the conveners um, and trying to really push forward, uh, give a visualization of what we're trying to do as a community. So, you know, right now we're in the gray bands. We would like to start construction ASAP on the red bands. And we have ideas of various readiness um, for the future to do this definitive search. We need a couple ideas. I, until I made this plot, I didn't realize there was a little bit here and there that we still need to fill in. And so that's the point. Several demonstrator scale experiments will be ready for a new DMNI process basically now. And so then this is the other way to look at this is looking at it just simply in bar graphs. And this I showed back in March. And then sort of the suite of techniques um, for future targets. So then sort of going back to our community goals, and then looking at scalar and vector dark matter and the techniques that are available there. And then once again, how they relate back to our community roadmap. And so then something that is new and why I wanted to show this slide is our community timeline. So right now we are running ADMX G2. We are waiting to start construction on DMNI number one for ADMX, EFR, and cubic meter. Um, we would be ready as soon as the money starts going for a new DMNI process, and hopefully they could get started within the next three years on their construction. And so uh, I'm not sure if that's clear, if I need to make that better uh, understanding of what the arrow starts mean, which is construction. Um, and uh, at that same time level, it would probably make sense for DMNI kind of in the scalar vector uh, area. If you've sort of followed this to its logical conclusion, um, after sort of three DMNIs in um, axion physics, you probably have covered most of the parameter space and probably could do that around 2040, which is beyond the current um, snow mass. Uh, but it's really nice that we could put that on to sort of a plot like this, similar to what other, other areas are going to be doing. I am sort of struggling a little bit on the scalar vector front. And so that's definitely one area um, where maybe we could um, um, add some more detail here. So then something that I was playing with this morning, which is some sort of discovery flowchart. Um, and so this is what I warned you was very much a work in progress, but you know, kind of going through what we had in the report of, so we make a discovery. Um, the big deal is that we have these light particles and we divide them up. Um, no matter what, we have some sort of proof of higher order theories and we can start doing dark matter astronomy. Then I wanted to go into kind of looking at the QCD axion in detail since um, since there's a little bit more work, and I could definitely take some more um, input on this and for scalar vector dark matter for both here and the report of both sort of signatures in the B modes for the CNB, new quarks, more Higgses, um, and sort of other um, sort of complementarity. And so that's where I am today and what I was planning to show um, um, in the, the coming snow mass months. Obviously, need to do some more work on the QCD axion. And so then as I talk to the rest of the CF community, remind everyone that we have these very nice community white papers um, and a thank you to all of you all. So at that, I wanted to go back and go to our community goals um, 
and sort of start a more detailed discussion on how do we, um, do we agree as a group that these are the community's goals? And then we can move into some more detailed questions after that. Um, so first up, community goals, comments, questions, concerns. I gotta pass the mic. All right, you can hold the mic way up in your face, like just get it right up there. Hi, this is uh, Aaron Cho. I just have a couple of comments. Uh, yeah. One, I think it's a really great to try to do a definitive search for the QCD axion. Uh, as a, a, a mid-career scientist, I'm a little dismayed at the timeline in which uh, <laughs> looking at uh, time scales that are probably past my retirement and probably I'll be dead and happily buried or something by the time we get there. Uh, so 2040, I, I we... Aaron, 2040. <laughs> Yeah, uh, one thing I think we need to keep in mind uh, strategically is uh, it's fine to talk about a suite of small experiments, but realistically to construct even a small scale magnet uh, takes at least three years just to fabricate the superconductor. And I think we ought to be pursuing a strategy where perhaps the national labs uh, or somebody uh, hosts a, a, a magnet facility uh, where that experiments could go into because you don't expect like a collider experiment to build in the cost of the accelerator and the time scale for building the accelerator into uh, into uh, into their experimental program. That's uh, something that's best handled by somebody else, and uh, you don't want to put a bunch of postdocs in charge of winding a magnet either. It's not uh, very long and tedious work, but it, there is there is a long, very long time scale to make a superconducting right. magnet. So I suggest so, that uh, that's something that we uh, put into the strategy. Um, so I suggest that that's something we insert into the yeah, strategy. Yeah. So, so Aaron, I would point you to that section of the report where we actually do have a section on an Axion facility. Um, I think we could do a better job outlining, um, adding some of the points you made there, which is sort of the timeline for making the magnets um, and the fact that in other areas we don't include the infrastructure for the accelerator. <laughs> right, and then my second comment is that, uh, at least in my experience, the uh, Axion searches are an area where uh, uh, you, instead of uh, having a broadband search that where you simultaneously probe at a bunch of different masses, you're only looking at one frequency at a time. And so this is an area where the uh, there's been a lot of complaints from everybody from Rocky Club to others that uh, there, people are frustrated with the slow pace of these experiments. And I'd like to point out all the technology that is there. And the only reason that we're not going twice as fast in an experiment like ADMX or Haystack is because of lack of funding. We had twice as much funding. We'd buy two magnets. We'd scan the frequency space twice as fast. We had three times as much funding. So instead of, instead of having $1 million a year, we had $3 million a year. We'd go three times as fast. Uh, sensitive, the cost scales linearly with sensitivity coverage of parameter space in this case. And I don't know any of any other uh, field in which uh, you have such a favorable scaling of sensitive of cost with sensitivity. And it seems like uh, uh, that could perhaps also be part of the uh, uh, something that we should point out. Yeah. Thanks. So, so Aaron, since I have you on the line, and um, I think those are all good points. Is the question of when do we talk about that? So we can get all those points into the report, um, but kind of the balance uh, between talking to like the greater snowmass community of about our science and our goals and like making ourselves look like organized community uh, versus like sort of kind of addressing something like funding versus um, scan rate. I, I, actually, I, I had one more thing to Aaron. Lindley, can you can you flip to the slide, our money and politics slide? Yeah. I yeah, I want I wanted to show so so yeah, yes, Aaron, I completely agree. That's what what this bar is. This and and the, the problem, the reason we're not this is not at the top to say the first thing we need to ask is a hundred million dollar magnet that everybody can go in, is I I don't feel like we are quite to the point where we can make a you know compelling argument for that much money. Because the, the there's kind of a question, it's not clear which of these fit in there. Some of them do, some of them are gonna work and some of them aren't. And it, it, I think we really, we need to direct some funds to get these to a state where we know which ones work and which ones don't. But I, 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 do, I, do, wish, I do wish this was up front and we were, we were saying as a community, yeah, we know exactly how we would use a hundred million dollar magnet and the whole community would take turns or use different ends. I'd love it. Yeah, so part oh, okay. of that, oh. 
uh, clap back on that. Oh, no, I just wanted to respond to Lindley. I, I, I don't think we should get involved with, in politics with the snow mass process. Our job here is to point out science opportunities. And so I think uh, we should cast everything in, in, that, in that sense that uh, we have a science opportunity uh, in which we can make rapid progress, far more rapid than we've been uh, doing. Uh, uh, we've, we've done a great job with uh, the current uh, uh, suite of, of wave dark matter experiments, but I think the technology is ready. And again, uh, the people are ready to go. The only thing that's limiting us is, uh, uh, well, I, hopefully, hopefully it's not a lack of ambition, but I guess I think uh, we can be very ambitious with uh, this next round. Yeah, no, and that's what I'm trying, trying to get across, and I hope it's come across, that we have a definitive goal and we just need the money to execute it. <laughs> um, so, uh, Gray, more questions? Yeah, yeah, okay, we, we have Dan here. So just as an outsider to CF2, maybe a way to try to formulate that is to convey the message to the rest of the community that there have been enormous technical developments and progress from theory to point the way. And this, this sub-discipline is not technically limited right now. Mm -hmm. And so th that's a way to frame the opportunities without necessarily mentioning money. Yeah, that's, thank you, not technically limited. That was the word I was gonna steal. Okay, got another back here. Lennis Brown, I, from as another outsider to CF2, I thought uh, Aaron's comment was really good, and I was shocked at Gray's reaction because, after all, the point of snow mass is to be talking about ten years from now, and surely ten years from now that would be valuable, and surely it'll take a number of years in order to get the funding in place, and there's a P5 process, and so on and so on. So they won't even be ready to use. For, for six or eight years, I suppose, most optimistically. And by then you'll know which ones can use it. Just an outsider's remark. Absolutely. For sure. I was seeing like in, in 10 years, I am pretty sure we would be able to put together a, a very coherent proposal that would say, this is exactly the suite of experiments that would fit inside a giant magnet. And it's, you know, some of these all together. Maybe we should be saying that now and pushing that up a, a bit. Yeah, well, I mean, I did, so, so it is there, it's in the document, it is at the back end. Uh, yeah, I guess you're right. Cause I mean, it, it's, it's a 10 year magnet too. Um, but I think maybe to expand on Aaron's point, there's um, many of these experiments and techniques would use very similar magnets. So you can build the magnet now because there's a large startup cost for that. There's a large time for, for that. And then these experiments as the other, as the remaining part of the technology gets ready, they could just go right into that. And so, yeah. So uh, Gray, could I jump in? Yeah, yeah just start talking. You're, you're on the... the Speakers. Yeah, so what I'm hearing from the room, and I would like Gray to kind of do the straw poll of nodding, um, and those online can maybe do some thumbs up, is that maybe we should advance the Axion facility up into the description in the executive summary of, of the definitive search for the Axion as something um, that the, uh, the design of such a facility um, be a, a, a higher we, Should we push that, that up in our timeline? I, I, I see no, 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 no's. I see a number of nods. It's okay. kind of, it's, I admit, Lindley, it's a tough crowd today. Not, they're not huge, like, emotional response. Oh, good question. <laughs> we got a thumbs up from Christian. That's all right. I don't understand the uh, technology well enough. Um, if you build this magnet facility, uh, can each small experiment use it fast enough that serial is okay? Or, you know, with an accelerator, that analogy doesn't quite work because you can pull the beam up in multiple places. So I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, do you need, do you really, is one magnet facility really that enabling? So you can't. That, that's, that's a tough one. GP, is it, do you have an answer to that or a second question? Yeah, so I guess the question was on, is this facility going to be good enough to do serial measurements because every experiment has its own issues. Um, and so my question was, is this facility really going to be 
Like we go to Oxford and say, give me 20, 10 Tesla modest sized magnets, maybe different size scales, but we host them at one facility where we have a bunch of technicians that can maintain them that we don't have to deal with that part. And then experiments come in and run their own kind of as a user facility almost maybe. Yeah. Right. Do, so do we get 10, 10 cubic meter ones or one 10 cubic meter? Right. So, so I can jump in here. So something like DM radio gut at the lowest masses requires a really big magnet. So I think we're looking at least at two magnets, but I think you could really make use of a facility sort of with common shielding and, and common technicians uh, to kind of really streamline this process and take as, as sort of Aaron was saying, kind of take the equivalent of the accelerator out of the picture. Um, so I don't think it's one magnet. I do think it's like a little bit of a, um, a farm of magnets, uh, but, but the facility and the common resources um, so that not every, um, every experiment is setting it up from scratch, like we're currently having to do with the DM&I projects. Yeah, just a suggestion coming from the outside. It sounds like you don't want to just necessarily say something like next generation facility, but rather um, exploration of how to get common facilities or how to how to how to how to as a as as a community, you know, exploit uh, common um, magnet you know magnet facility approaches, you know, but something a little more explored to acknowledge that you have to figure out what it's going to be and that that's the task you're going to be doing in the next ten years. And so that's sort of what we have in the report right now is that this is sort of almost community homework um, at, at this point. Um, and that's sort of where my gut is going, um, but that we do have a really great community, I think, to come together and, and do this. Uh, so that for the next snow mass, we're really saying, you know, one magnet facility or possibly, you know, since the DMI project runs faster, um, but, you know, kind of in the next DMI, start pushing for that. Yes. Um, not to get into too much of a detailed technical magnet discussion, but I think one thing that's frustrated this idea is that there are at least three very different magnets that are appropriate for different kinds of magnets. You know, there's a lot, there's sort of a niobium titanium large solenoid, then there's like a, you know, rare earth magnet at higher field but smaller bore, and then there's a, a dipole for the Mad Max concept. And so the field isn't, you know, we're not really sure which package of experiments map into which magnets and which things should really go ahead. So I don't, well, it's, so it's, I think if, I think if it was clear that we just wanted one big magnet of a certain type, then we, in this white paper, we probably would have converged on that. We, we certainly can, can emphasize more that this is something we got to figure out and figure out soon. Um, I saw a hand on Zoom. Mariana. Uh, hi. So uh, uh, thank you, Lindy. Lindy, it's, it's a, I think, great summary from the community. But being a theorist and from someone different subfield, uh, just following up on all of those questions, I'm really curious, is, it, is an issue funding a QCD action it's essentially a funding issue. Do we really have a full understanding and technology? And if it just had 10 times more funding with you know, extra magnets in the facility that could be done in definitively in 50 year, 15 years scanning the entire region. So that's, I guess, my first question. And I guess that follows from the other questions we should have just heard. Uh, and the second question, could you put up your summary, the executive summary with four, um, uh, this one, right. Uh, I, I, I do have a suggestion on a theory support because right now, and I know there is, of course, more expanded version of the full document, but I suggest that the theory su support is written here should not only include understanding the role of those scalar vector and ALPS in cosmology and astrophysics, but also looking for further detect new detector modalities because a lot of the ideas in this, those NOMAS papers are completely new. Most of them have not existed in the past SNOMAS. And I think explicitly to express here that uh, searches for further way um, of detecting those uh, ultralight dark matter is also an important theory goal. Perfect. It's getting added as we speak. Yes. 
I saw that go in there and I was, I was like, oh, that's missing. I should add that. But then we started. <laughs> so got that, Mariana. And um, if you could check the executive summary of the main uh, and make sure you're happy with how we described that, that would be really great. Absolutely. Um, want to, we really want to capture that correctly. Excellent. But I, I'm still curious in terms of what do we actually need to find the QCD axiom? You know, really, if we could have everything, I mean, if you could have much, much higher, and, and just regardless of the snow massive process, but uh, I'm just curious, is this an issue of still deciding on technologies or it's really issue of building? So, so I'm gonna say my opinion and what I think we're gathering from the room. Um, there are, in addition to the two DMNI projects, there's other ideas that are sort of coming, that are almost to the level of becoming projects and could, could go forward shortly. And there's a couple areas of the frequency space that are hard because you're at the borders between frequency ranges. And I think that's where our intuition for an ENM can really help us is that you kind of, you know, have to swap over electronics, swap over detection mechanisms. And so that's why, you know, a, I put down on our timeline that, you know, we have, you know, in the next sort of five years, we have other projects that are ready to go. Um, and then probably we have, uh, you know, 10 years for some of these other regions before they are ready to go. Um, and so some of this future is near term and some of this future is definitely closer um, uh, to, to the next snow mass. Um, but, you know, kind of on the timeline of the next snow mass, it might make more sense to build one Axion facility to host multiple frequency bands, if that makes sense. So what we need to capture now is that, that there are some ideas that are ready for construction, some ideas that are ready to go, and some that need some R&D. And I hope we were sort of capturing that in the roadmap. Yeah, I, if, Mariana, if I, 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 I correct me if I'm wrong, folks, I, if I capture the, the, the thinking of the community is, is everybody's got their idea for somewhere on this parameter space, and that's totally going to work. Everybody else's, eh, maybe it will, maybe it won't. So we got to try a lot of things. There, there's some technological development to be done in that blue region. Um, but we seem to have enough ideas that, that something's going to break our way eventually. Yeah, and I, that's, I, I like the way you put that. Like we have an idea basically for the entire search and we're ready to execute. We're ready to like execute two of these like today. We're ready to execute another handful of them in the next five years. And we should be ready in the next 10 years to do all of them. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Aaron Cho again. I just wanted to bring us back again, sorry, to the uh, analogy with the accelerator and the collider detector. And you, I, I don't think people wait to build the accelerator uh, until uh, the final design of the collider detector is ready because they, the two have to proceed concurrently. And I think the analogy is quite apt because as Gray said, and I alluded to like a, a CMS scale solenoid uh, it takes 10 years to build, it's a hundred million dollars. Uh, and that's something that of, of a scale that only a national lab can handle. Uh, and if we know uh, just on, on the back of an envelope, uh, how much magnetic energy you need to serve as a target uh, for, for a general axion experiment, then in, in, in some sense, the detector technology doesn't really matter uh, in the same way that the detector technology doesn't really matter for an LHC experiment, uh, you know you, you need to have this luminosity to be able to see a certain cross section. We'll figure out the detector later. We know we need the accelerator here. We know we need the magnet just from the back of an envelope calculation. You know, Aaron, all right. So since I, since I feel like, Lindley, we're hearing from the group a big push to go bolder. Can you, can you go back to the, our list of our roadmap? Let's make them do some work. Where do you want us? Do you, so, so if it's if it's gonna if that's a serious thing that we really want, then even if it's you know it's just getting ready for it to be built in the next ten years, do you want to see another roadmap item, or do you want to see uh, a line in our you know? So this is the executive summary. This is the only thing people read. Is there a, a a sentence on our first entry? What do you all think? How would you wordsmith this? So I could envision supporting, enabling. So going. So my hesitancy is that in some respects, I'm, I feel like we're at a cusp on magnet technology and that I wouldn't want to start building that magnet today. 
Um, well, you can't. It, it, I, I think that the statement from, from the group here is, is that you want to start asking for the magnet today so you can build it yeah. in two years. Um, you, you, just, you don't even so, get ready when you ask. Right. So support um, enabling technologies, design multi, um, design, you know, Axion magnet facility and support cross-disciplinary collaborations, something like that. Do we have any, anybody from the, the infrastructure front here here? This seems like something they, that we should put to them too. Here we go. Connors for again, uh, again, a comment uh, from outside. It looks so fragmented and kind of piddling, frankly, what I'm seeing. If I'm trying to imagine some congressional uh, staffer looking at this thing, um, why not combine the last two, support enabling technologies, cross disciplinary, and theory beyond the QCD axion, just so you don't have too long a list, and then add, uh, begin development of a national uh, facility. And, and that can be, it doesn't have to be specific. You know, you could say supporting these experiments, including a magnet, right? It, it's, you don't have to have the plan. You need to have a commitment to make the plan. I'm intimidated by your boldness. Thank you. It's maybe, yeah, that, that, that may be very well what we need to do. All right, some questions in the back. No, don't don't shout them out. I know it's it's a small room, but there's a bunch of Zoom people. All right, how about you and then pass it back? Okay, so I'm also an outsider here, but you know there there is a a national you know National Science Foundation supported magnet user facility um, that's just it's at Florida State University, so that's why I know that it exists, um, and I just. It, you know, you're talking about having a facility where there are technicians that can maintain magnets and stuff like that. I don't know if there's thoughts of partnering with existing magnet technology facilities to help this kind of science. So that was, that was a comment that I had as an outsider. Okay, since you're in the room and ADMX has closer ties to the magnet mag lab than GM Radio. Yeah, so the, the question is about uh, partnering with existing magnet facilities. We have been talking to, to people at the, the National High Magnetic Field Lab, there is um, there's a problem of, of, first of all, not knowing exactly what you want. And, and the, the Axion community seems to be big volume high field and the they want like ultra high field and a very small volume, sometimes pulsed. It's that they usually, it, it, we're trying to maximize B squared V. That's what, what all the Axion experiments want is, is big stored energy. And that's not, the same direction that their magnets are currently going. And so we can't just use what they've got. However, we could certainly use their expertise. Uh, hey, this is uh, John. I only had a, a small comment. I agreed with the, the point that a, um, a, a, a magnet user facility should be its own point in this uh, roadmap. And uh, I agree with the, the notion that we should be bolder and, and start talking about that now. Um, if the experiments, uh, you had one of the, the plots was a timeline that had sort of all the experiments running till 2040. Um, if we're talking about that kind of time scale, I think we would have to start talking about a uh, magnet user facility in this snow mass, not next, or you know, seriously talking about it in this one, not next. Thank you. You're right, and the uh, it would make the the DMNI projects a lot easier if there was a facility they could happen in, you know, by number two or number three. Was there there a chat a chat window? Hold on. What? Where? Oh God, where's the chat? Where? More. I, I can read it out. So can, can, you, can you read it out, Lindley? I might have lost my chat. Yeah. So actually, and then I can go backwards since, since there was some other in the chat. So uh, Sam says other national labs with major magnet facilities include Fermilab, Brookhaven, Berkeley, um, of which uh, I think the Axion experiments 
I guess with Giannis is at Brookha uh, connected to Brookhaven, um, but yes, uh, those national facilities, uh, it, it, that, that is what we sort of would like to tap into, I think, is, is the expertise already at the national labs to make this happen, a la what Anne's point is with the accelerators. Rambling, but sort of answers, I think, Sam's question. Uh, Mariana has a, a specific uh, uh, request for the wording of the roadmap and- Oh, we'll no, no, no. It's, it's, it's not as much a request, it's just as I said, just thinking aloud. Maybe this should just be yeah. bold and essentially I said pretty much, you know, uh, yeah, national quantum facility for HEP research. Uh, or, I mean, that essentially, uh, Wave like dark matter search facility, which would pretty much cover the QCD action and anything else. Yeah. Because if, if, if essentially to develop such a facility will take the whole 10 years. So mm -hmm. if, the, if the community thinks that's a good idea of starting now, how that's going to look like, uh, the, the, that's just what I'm hearing. And, the, and the, of course, again, I'm a theorist here. So. Um, but no, I think I think you have a really good point there, and I think this has been an incredibly fruitful discussion for the community to have. That really we need to actually come together and start start this now. Um, and so, you know, and some of what came out as I was writing was that some of that infrastructure, you know, obviously is the mag, but other parts of it are more applicable. You know, as far as sort of like you know, um, EM shielding and quantum, you know. Um, you know, DAC for squid-based readout, et cetera, um, which is definitely going to be able to be transported between different experiments. Um, and then Alex actually has a physics question, which is, are there plans for comparable experiment sensitivity figures for masses much, much less than 10 to the 12 EV? Um, and so that is, I think, more related to QCD axion, Alex? Could I get clarification? I really we have an answer here. Okay. So, so I, I remember seeing of order half a dozen figures in the in the new uh, New Horizons white paper that had various different experimental sensitivity projections for uh, you know ultra ultralight dark matter candidates, and I didn't see any figures appearing in that slide along that. Avenue, and I was just wondering whether there were plans to come up with some kind of summary figure. Yeah, so there's there's this, but then then there are figure. I mean, in the white paper, there were lots of figures showing a two dimensional plots uh, in this parameter space, and so maybe the answer is no. This will be the figure that summarizes ultralight uh, models. So, on that figure, Lindy. Um. So Casper, um, so Casper is definitely on the um, okay. on the QCD axion figures. So Casper, and then of course Casper is this hatched uh, shading um, uh, to indicate the the slightly different coupling. Um, so yeah. So so the 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 so in the QCD axion, I don't think there was anything. Anything that does QCD axion that doesn't also appear on this plot, and but we did extend this the the scalar vector, other you know kind of the, the much broader scale goes down that low, right? Yeah. So so the, so so yeah so, so I mean and, and this is something you, you can you can you can tell us is is the wrong thing to do is we felt that this was fairly inclusive of every, you know once once you get to, to ultra 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 lights it's a it's a kind of a broader category of models and so we filed it here. If there's stuff that is like directed at exactly like the QCD axion that does reach the ultra ultra that isn't already on the plot, that's a, that's an oversight and let us know. You got one? Yeah, so on the, the scalar vector, the mass range goes much lower. Uh, Hugh, I think on the Slack was asking about the, that we should probably be more definitive on the range of masses for the QCD axion. And this actually couples to the question of, you know, what we're setting our limits on. Um, and so actually, I think this more expanded plot makes sense here where you start to see the, uh, um, the black hole limits coming in. Um, and so for the QCD axion, we didn't hear a lot of push for things that go beyond the black hole limits. Um, 
yeah, sorry, sorry. I, I think I, I um, led to more confusion. So, so this was not specifically on QCD axion. The question is, is so right now the the way I see these these slides presented, the emphasis is is very much on this mass range of QCD axion candidates, and the question is really for the community is is, you know that appears to be a very intentional decision. And what, what is coming across to me is that the experiments that we're proposing to go into out parameter space at ultralight masses basically get pigeonholed into a single bullet on your floor bullet slide where it's, it's like a subcomponent of that bullet that says explore R&D for these experiments. And I just want to make sure that is how it's coming across to me, which is, is fine if that's the community's priority, but uh, just pointing out that, that that is how it comes across. I, I could be provocative in my, my answer in that, that so, so in this range, we feel like in this snow mass period, we have technological leverage to hit the QCD axion. There are good ideas for the ultra ultra lights. And the provocative thing is I am not sure any of those are going to, you know, get, I mean, look, look at how far the QCD axion line goes down in coupling. That's tough stuff to do, and and so I I was getting the impression community that's things they want to do small R and D before they push to the QCE limit, and people can tell me I'm wrong. That's fine. Oh, so so great. When you're talking, are you talking about QCD axion below ten to the minus twelve? Yes. Maybe? Yes. Right, and I thought there was push though coming sort of from the theory side of. Well, there, there's a question of, of, so in our experiment plots, we highlight this because that's where the experiments are right now. And we don't want to make people think there aren't any candidates below, but it, it, my impression was that, that none of the experiments were thinking this snow mass period to get that low. And it's, I'm, I'm happy to get, you know, conflict, you know, other, other opinions. Oh, anyway, there's a question up here. I just wanted to follow up on that. It seems like, uh, especially on figure 10, the plot range should just go a lot deeper down to the uh, fuzzy dark matter region because it's certainly of interest and people are certainly thinking about um, you know other other models and that there's after all in, in uh, string theory a plethora of very light states that aren't QCD axions and so to me it looks really limited to say oh there's nothing below right there's this blue line of the future <laughs> why not just let it go down even if there's nothing in there which i think there is but even if there were nothing it's very important as a perception of the field of what's out there that needs to be explored so could i you know push back a little bit in this area in that Wave dark matter, even more than the rest of dark matter, ends up looking like a collection of things that just people exploring. And sort of my understanding of where cosmology is, is that we have, and what sort of we're putting forward is that we have two cosmological scenarios, the post-inflation scenario, where we're really pushing sort of to higher frequencies, and the pre-inflation scenario, which is most clearly motivated at the moment in that nano EV region, EV region for the gut scale. Now, and therefore sort of we can do a definitive search in this sort of nano EV up to, through the micro EV range um, and really say something about both particle physics and, um, and sort of dark matter physics. Um, and that, you know, these other candidates are very interesting and there's things to explore, um, but both on the theory side and on the technique side, as a community, we don't have quite as much motivation. Like we're not gonna put a billion dollars into searching at 10 to the minus 22 EV at the moment. And so that's sort of my picture of it. And I'm not sure if I'm hearing that maybe that's not the community's vision at the moment. But I do really worry about our community and making sure we're like very on message that we have something to look for and it's really important right now. Um, that we can say something definitive. I think that's the word I'm going for, is that definitive. Hey, Lindley, this is Hugh. Um, so yeah. I, I resonate with your comment and it, I think it comes through in CF1 too, right? There's the balance has to be drawn somewhere in saying that the thing we are doing right now is motivated and maybe even the best motivated because that's why we're doing it now without closing the door to doing something else in the future 
if the thing we're doing now doesn't turn up fruit, right? And that's, you can't- Or if we have some bigger understanding come through. Yeah, that you, you that can't say we're doing that. everything right now, yeah. but you also don't want to say this is it and because we don't know. And that's that's the strike. That's, anyway, I, I, think, I think you guys have done from where I'm sitting well in trying to strike that balance, but I understand. Right, and so, I mean, I think kind of going in back to where we started, which is sort of at the moment, the community, so talking for the, the wave dark matter community, which is we want to do a definitive search for the QCD axion, and maybe we should put some mass ranges in here. And we want to do a big push on theory and R&D to better understand the sort of ultralight, and maybe we need to work on that a little bit within pseudoscalers and the scalar and vector candidates. And so it's not closing the door on them, but at the moment, you know, the small projects um, um, and slash small experiments and this, you know, facility that we talked about, um, they need to be sort of aimed at this QCD axion uh, search. Ray, are you seeing any agreement or disagreement in the room? Like I said, it's a tough crowd today. They're hard to read. Maybe it's just we haven't done any in-person meetings and everyone's wearing a mask. I don't see any like, because I can't see who's frowning. Yeah. Here, John, John had something to say. Yeah, I was just going to, so this is a bit of a theory question. Uh, is there QCD axion with below 10 to the minus 12? I think that's where you get over the Planck scale. So below that, my understanding would be uh, Alps. And so that would, you could, you could make the argument that this is sort of the QCD axion plot. And maybe you would have a different plot that's, you know, the broader, uh, Alp landscape that would be sort of beyond the, the current search. And uh, so Lindley, can you go to slide? Oh, sorry, uh, Lindley can't hear. Uh, I can't. Yeah, so, so can yeah, so if you go to slide nine, uh, uh, the comment was that this is the QCD axion plot, and then slide 10 is the Alps plot. And so um, I guess yeah. the way that I interpreted this was uh, that these were both QCD, so, uh, trying to convey a QCD axion story. So I don't know, maybe, maybe it should be combined. Um, but I guess this is the slide nine is, is current and slide 10 is sort of future. Um, but maybe yeah, there, there I have, be yeah, I can add the 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 alp um, the alp bound to this one. I just I grabbed a slide that didn't have the uh, the alp misalignment band on it. That's yeah, that's I, uh, Lindley. It's, uh, so I, I think the problem is that the the title of slide ten should also have the word QCD axion to make make it clear. Okay. Uh, that's, thank you. Those two are the same. That that is this that is that's saying targeting the QCD axion this snow mass period here is current limits here where we're trying to go in the next 10 years. And then perhaps there could be one more that says, if you want, you know, the, the entire Alp space. So sort of a partner to the um, scalar vector that, mm -hmm. that does cover that region. I kind of felt like if you said scalar vector Alps, would that be sufficient? Because this is, this is where we go into like, look, here's, here's not, the, not necessarily the next 10 years, but the next, like the, the 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 next century of physics is addressing all these things. Though many of them are are running for the next ten years. Just as a small comment from my side, I think the techniques for scalars and vectors are um, quite a bit different from those of Alps. Um, this is because of the pseudoscalar nature, um, <coughs> making it harder to exploit. Um, let's say some of the more generic coherent effects. Um, All right, so folks, we're almost out of time. Yeah. Um, so I think we've got our marching orders. I haven't seen a huge number of hands shoot up. I think on this slide, um, you could just change opportunities in scalar vector dark matter to just general wave like dark matter or like beyond the QCD axion. So, you know, it just becomes definitive search for the QCD axion and look for everything beyond the QCD axion that is also wave like dark matter. Okay, so um, we got to head out. There's another group coming in. Where, when, where, where shall we meet? When and where shall we meet again? What's on the cheat sheet, Lindley? Oh, she's muted.
Okay, I, I got it. Uh, um, let me quickly share. For those that somehow avoided my um, uh, my right. email so, so far. I can start bringing up here. I've got some bad news for you about the AV setup. Yeah, so Ray, Gray, you get that set up. And so for everyone else, we have a cheat sheet. And so um, right now we are overlapping with an instrumentation frontier, which includes quantum sensors. So you might wanna go back. You might wanna listen to CF3 next. Um, and then tomorrow morning is dark matter complementary complementarity and tomorrow afternoon snow mass wide dark talk dark matter talks including tracy slot talk um, which will include us so important day tomorrow stay tuned and i'll stop sharing now all right i'm stepping out all right bye bye lindley bye guys bye everybody See you. Or do you, are you on the CFU mailing list? Hello. Can people online hear me? Okay. Yep. Yep. Good. All these are available. I think you have to check out. Maybe. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Alex, Alex, I can hear you. Although maybe not anymore, right? <laughs> With the, so I think they muted the room. Did uh, someone online try talking? Hey, Alex. Hi. I think we can hear you okay. Can we get someone to try again online? Uh, this is Mariana. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Yes, very clear. Very clearly. Oh, that's an improvement. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think we're ready to start in record time. Yeah, so where is... Uh... Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my uh, screen. Okay, hopefully people online can see can see my slides. Is that true maybe a thumbs up it's up now okay great thanks everyone uh so welcome to the the third uh the third subsection of this session um so this is uh the cf3 uh dark matter cosmic probes um topical group and uh Haibo and I are here in the room, and Haibo is going to try and take notes. Chanda is online, uh, and I know that there are a number of people online. Just to give the people online a sense of, of what the setup is, is that we have uh, one microphone. Uh, so we are going to pass that around to, we're asking people in the room to wait until they receive the mic to uh, comment. So hopefully you online will be able to hear well, and then your, your audio is piped through the room speakers so we can hear you 
uh, pretty clearly if you speak. Okay, so just to set the context here for people in the room who uh, may not have been involved in the, the CF3 process. Uh, so uh, just as a reminder, cosmological and astrophysical measurements provide the only robust positive empirical measurements of dark matter that we have so far. Uh, they're unique in the sense that they do not rely on the assumption that dark matter couples uh, with normal matter beyond gravity. And in this sense, they're some of the most expansive and could be the only viable approach to learning more about the dark matter problem. Uh, cosmic probes require strong synergy between particle theorists, dynamicists, simulators, observers, experimentalists. And this is, has historically been a difficult mechanism to support within uh, the high energy physics uh, community. Uh, and so one of the emphases from this, that has come from this group is, is coming up with a new mechanism to support that. Uh, and then uh, finally here, uh, cosmic probes are uh, highly relevant and complementary to the other search efforts that we've seen uh, today and, and throughout the snow mass process, in, including CF1, CF2, CF7, across the other frontiers, including energy and intensity frontiers. And then furthermore, there's strong experimental synergy uh, with cosmological uh, probes, experimental cosmological probes of dark energy and inflation in CF4, CF5, CF6. So this is sort of how CF3 fits into the landscape of, of the Cosmic Frontier program. Uh, it, uh, scientifically, we are aligned with CF1, 2, and 7. Experimentally, we're more aligned with CF4, 5, and 6. So SNOMAS 2013 did not have a CF3. CF3 was not included in that process. And the result was this table from the 2014 P5 report, where you can look and see the main uh, cosmic survey experiments, uh, LSST, CMBS4, and DESI. You can see the science that they were identified as uh, having access to, neutrinos and cosmic acceleration. And you notice that none of these were characterized as having a dark matter reach. So this has led to challenges in expanding the scientific sp scope of these experiments to allow the, the physicists that are working on them uh, to explore fundamental dark matter physics with these very powerful and expensive experiments that, that we've invested in as, as the HEP community. So uh, one of the main goals of CF3 is to avoid having something like this happen again in this P5. Uh, so throughout the process, we've received 75 letters of interest from the community. Uh, we solicited five white papers um, with set facilitators and uh, large contributions from the community. A uh, big thank you to the facilitators and authors of those white papers. And then in addition, we received about five, five to six uh, white papers. Um, and there are a number of other relevant white papers that were submitted to other, other topical groups that also apply to, to CF3. Uh, so this is roughly where we are in, in the timeline. So we're now here in, in Seattle, some of us. Uh, and we expect that the report is going to need to be sort of finalized by the end of this month. Uh, if anyone knows differently, please tell us. Um, and this is borrowed from CF1 and CF2. I'll just flash this up. Here are some other, for people at the meeting or joining online, here are some other sessions you may be interested in. Um, and so here is, is the current status of uh, the report. Haibo, maybe you can share these slides on the Slack channel so people online can, uh, can also access them. But we have a, a new draft of the CF3 report. We've circulated several drafts uh, over the last several weeks, uh, actually several months, and very, we're very thankful for the input to the community. Uh, what we're going to use this time for is to go through briefly some of the key takeaway points and figures that are coming through in the CF3 report, hopefully have some time to discuss them in a little bit more detail. Uh, and, your, and sort of the community's continued feedback is, is very welcoming. Um, Okay, uh, so this is, this is the report. Uh, currently, the way we're assembling the author list is, is we've ex extended authorship to all of the facilitators of the young, incoming white papers, and we've asked them to identify contributor, contributors to their white papers that they think also should be included as authors. If you have contributed uh, in a way that you think merit, merits authorship on this, please just reach out to us. We're not trying to be exclusive here. We're just, uh, we're just trying to co collect you know, people who have made meaningful contributions to the report so that they're represented here. 
So here are, from our executive summary, the, the three core HEP community priorities. Uh, so the first priority is that uh, cosmological studies of dark matter should be supported as a key component of the HEP Cosmic Frontier Program due to their unique ability to probe dark matter microphysics and the link the results of terrestrial dark matter experiments to cosmological measurements. The second is that the construction of future cosmology experiments is critical for expanding our understanding of dark matter physics. Uh, those, there are a large suite of facilities being proposed that have come up through the snow mass process. Uh, a large number of them can provide uh, sensitivity to dark matter physics, as well as the physics of dark energy and inflation. Uh, HEP involvement will be essential to constructing and operating these facilities. And during the design and, and construction process, dark matter physics should be considered as one of the key science drivers of, of future facilities. Um, and then finally, cosmic probes provide robust sensitivity to the microphysical properties of dark matter. Uh, theory, simulation, observation, exper and experiment must be supported together to maximize the efficacy of cosmic probes of dark matter physics. I'm gonna go through the slides, try and give you a sense, and then we can come back to each of these and, and discuss in more detail. Here are the five major science opportunities. Um, uh, the first one is an emphasis on small scale structure, the small scale clustering of dark matter and what that can teach us from the distribution of dark matter about the fundamental physics of the, of the dark sector. So measurements of the distribution of dark matter should be supported as a key element of the HEP Cosmic Frontier Program to understand the fundamental nature of dark matter. The next one is an opportunity. We are currently probing the uh, the very boundary of where dark matter halos, we believe that dark matter halos are populated by baryons to form galaxies. We think that in the next decade, it should be possible to detect and measure dark matter halos that are devoid of baryonic matter. Uh, this is essentially like a test of the ether, right? We have Lambda CDM. It's predicting that dark matter halos should exist below the threshold of galaxy formation. We need to test that prediction. So that's, a, that's the second point here. You can read it for yourself. Uh, in, the, in the draft. The next is that extreme astrophysical environments, so these are black holes, neutron stars, white dwarfs, stellar interiors, uh, provide um, environments that are inaccessible uh, in terrestrial experiments. Instruments, observations, and theory, theorists that study these extreme environments should be supported as an essential means to constrain the expanding landscape of dark matter models. And this is important for also guiding terrestrial experiments. Uh, the fourth point is that numerical simulations, cosmological simulations play a key role in interpreting observational uh, measurements of dark matter um, and that HEP computational resources and expertise can be combined with astrophysical simulations to rapidly advance numerical simulations of dark matter physics. <laughs> Excuse me. And then finally, the interdisciplinary nature of dark matter research calls for interagency mechanisms that support a comprehensive pursuit of scientific opportunities cutting across traditional boundaries. So this addre addresses the fact that currently funding and, and scientists pursuing this type of dark matter study are spread across uh, DOE HEP, NSF physics, NSF ast astronomy, and NASA funding. And it's hard to bring those resources and scientists together to really extract the most information that we, we can about dark matter from the only, uh, the only process that we currently know that it couples through gravity, right? So we're trying to extract as much information as we can from, uh, from the observations that we have. So here's our first uh, summary figure. This is trying to put all everything onto one figure. Uh, we've gotten a lot of good feedback on this so far. It's certainly uh, under development. But the idea is that uh, cosmic probes of dark matter really cover the entire accessible uh, mass uh, parameter space, as well as bounding, uh, so setting the upper and lower bounds on the, the range of parameter space that we are considering searching for dark matter candidates. Uh, these measurements are highly complementary. Uh, they involve halo measurements, measuring the distribution of dark matter, as well as extreme environments. They test a range of, of different dark matter particle physics models, uh, and they cover a range of different experimental and, and observational techniques, and numerical simulations are important across, across this range. Uh, here is a beautiful figure that came out of uh, one of our white papers on uh, dark matter 
uh, halos. So for people in the audience that uh, are, um, are not so used to seeing matter power spectra, this is essentially showing how the distribution and clustering of matter uh, as a function of scale, so small, uh, large scales to the left, right, small scales to the right, ends up being dependent on the particle physics of dark matter. So if dark matter is warm, uh, self-interacting, uh, interacting with the standard model with some coupling strength, all of that will cause potentially observable uh, deviations from the lambda CDM model that could be measured with astrophysical and cosmological probes. Uh, in many cases, these are suppressions in the, the formation of small scale structure. In some cases, they're enhancements, formations of ultra compact uh, halos or ultra compact objects. Uh, this is an image, uh, a figure that, uh, that Ethan and Annika and Matt uh, have been sort of uh, workshopping with us over the last week to try and show this in a more particle physics oriented parameter space where we essentially have on the, the y-axis, this is inspired by a Buck, Buckley and Peter, Matt Buckley and Annika Peter's paper from several years ago. But on the left-hand side, we have essentially a, uh, a time scale either for interaction or decay of dark matter. On, on the x-axis, we have a scale, a cosmological scale. So the wave number is similar to the right. Uh, on the simulation side, uh, we've uh, removed uh, this figure that was primarily intended to show the complexity of numerical simulation and analysis and instead replaced it with a pretty picture of, of just how you can see that numerical simulations of different dark matter models yield different observable distributions of dark matter in the universe. Uh, so if you can measure the small scale structure, you can distinguish between uh, different particle physics models of, of dark matter. Uh, on the right, we have a, a very beautiful picture that sort of sort of shows the pipeline uh, that goes from numerical simulations through observations uh, to constrain dark matter particle properties. Uh, this is a figure that tries to put um, the entire uh, extreme environments white paper uh, onto onto one image. Um, it shows that extreme environments can cover a wide range of different dark matter particle physics models. Uh, over a wide range of dark matter uh, masses. Um, it's a bit uh, busy. So we've been talking to the, the facilitators of that white paper about whether there's some way to uh, compress this information a little bit more and convey the same message about the diversity of dark matter models that can be probed through extreme environments. Uh, this is a, a figure that um, the CF1 group put, to, put together for their town hall. We're thinking something at roughly that order of complexity would be a, a nice way to, to compress, but this is currently being workshopped. Uh, another avenue that is, is interesting is primordial black holes. This tells us, excuse me, not only about uh, potential, a potential dark matter candidate, um, in many cases, a subdominant component of dark matter, but also tells us about early universe physics. If you're able to detect primordial black holes, you learn something about, um, about early universe physics, some non-Gaussianity uh, in, in the original field that allows you to form these very compact objects. And there's a large range of discovery potential here for upcoming facilities, including uh, Rubin LSST. Um, we haven't had any major comments on this apart from the fact that we may want to change some of the colors in this figure. Here uh, in the next two slides, I'm going to show a set of figures that we've been workshopping to show the complementarity with CF1 and CF2. Uh, so this is complementarity with, with CF1 direct detection constraints. Uh, there are two versions of these figures. They're, they're this, they show the same constraints and projections, but in one case, we break down uh, where the constraints are coming from, the specific probes and analyses that are being used to set those constraints. These are constraints on the dark matter nucleon scattering cross-section as a function of dark matter mass. Uh, what we are hearing right now is that there is some preference for the figure on the right that shows just a summary without the extreme level of detail. Uh, but it, it may be that both of these versions of the figure are useful for different purposes and different audiences. Um, and uh, we've also received comments that we need to include in some way, uh, constraints from Big Bang nucleosynthesis and cosmic ray upscattering, uh, which have you know, some, some model dependence in them, but, but probably belong on, on this figure. Uh, 
so theory theory help would be very uh, useful here. Yeah, Risa. Uh, this is where it, uh, the figure that I scraped this from cut off, and I don't feel qualified to extend it uh, down. So I, yes, I would love if someone wanted to provide information to help me extend that to lower masses. Yes. Uh, an earlier version of this figure had like a dashed line that just extended uh, horizontally, but uh, yeah, I got nervous putting that on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I need to reach out to the, yeah, the author of this and see if we can do something quick, yeah. Uh, here is a figure showing complementarity with uh, CF2, so wave-like dark matter, and you can maybe see where some of my questions were coming on the, lo the low mass end of this, of this parameter space. Uh, so what we're showing here are constraints on, uh, on light and ultralight dark matter candidates. Uh, coming from a range of different cosmic probes, including small-scale structure, extreme environments, uh, stellar interiors, stellar, and uh, as well as measurements of the uh, extragalactic background light and things like that. Uh, and so uh, this is needs some work. So there are black hole super radiance uh, constraints that come in here that we saw show up in one of the CF1, uh, sorry, CF2 figures. And then we need to figure out what kinds of sensitivity uh, projections could be made for the higher end of this mass range. Um, okay, uh, so uh, we then have a section on our white paper on facilities. Sorry, let me move this. Um, so, uh, Right now, we have sort of a laundry list of all of the facilities that were brought forward in this process as being avenues to study dark matter physics through cosmological observations. Uh, the current thing we're struggling with is, is how uh, do we sort of best, um, best motivate uh, these projects. There are some projects that are more on shell than others. There are some that are better aligned with the, uh, the direction of the HEP per portfolio. Uh, but uh, we've been given advice not to prioritize. And so uh, we are sort of trying to figure out how to, to walk this line um, to both present the range of opportunities, as well as to call out some specific facilities that have good alignment to, to the program. And I think the two that are probably coming out most directly as far as future facilities are concerned is some, some kind of large scale, massively multiplex spectroscopic survey uh, and potentially future high resolution CMB experiments that would go after CMB S4. Uh, there are others, uh, there are a large number of other facilities that have been called out, including US Extremely Large Telescope Program, future NASA miss missions in the MEV to GEV range, as well as radio observations, uh, both at 21 centimeter and other wavelengths. Um, one thing that we talked about early on and is probably worth discussing at this meeting more is whether there is uh, a need uh, and the risks involved in calling for something like a dark matter task force. So the dark energy task force was extremely useful in motivating the previous generation of dark energy experiments. A dark matter task force would have a similar goal, trying to come up with some kind of figure of merit. The parameter space is much more complicated here. Um, but that could potentially motivate uh, a future experiment. The risk is that presenting such a task force could be what, the only thing that comes out of this process and that no facility development could move forward until that task force report came out. And so there is sort of a cost benefit analysis that needs to be done there. Currently, we are not calling out this dark matter task force idea. Um, we have a section on tools for, for cosmic probes. So uh, supporting collaborative infrastructure within the existing HEP projects to do dark matter physics, new support me mechanisms, cross-disciplinary support, something on the level of future DMNI calls, uh, the linkage with artificial intelligence and machine learning, as well as the linkage with cosmology data preservation, which are both white papers that were submitted across other frontiers. And then we finally have a section where we are going through three different potential uh, discovery scenarios where from cosmic observations, we learn 
uh, more about the fundamental makeup of, of dark matter. Uh, and Risa is going to be going through uh, some examples in her, her talk later, later this week. Um, OK, so we have some feedback uh, from the community that we have not yet been able to figure out how to address properly. So I will call this out here very briefly, and then we'll open up the floor for discussion and, and comments. So the first point is that uh, it's, it's true that you know, uh, everything we know about dark matter comes from astrophysics, uh, but we may be overemphasizing that point to the, to the extent that we're alienating some of the other communities. I certainly made it very strongly here. Uh, so this, I think, is a good audience that will give us feedback on that statement. Um, dark matter, uh, another point is that dark matter astrophysics is now a precision science. Uh, and um, that there has been a lot of progress made both in observations and theory calculations. Uh, and we may need to emphasize this point more in the report. Um, we need to have some more quantitative projections for, the sens for sensitivity in order to make comparisons with other fields and science topics, as well as to motivate future facilities. This is a big ask to happen before the end of the month. Um, and so, yeah, we're not quite sure how to, how to deal with that. Um, and then uh, considerations of how astrophysical probes fit into the whole cosmic frontier and what are realistic goals for how astrophysical probes of dark matter could be featured in the overall cosmic frontier report. And so I think that's something, a discussion topic for later, later this week. Uh, something that I picked up from Tim uh, in CF1 discussion is that we also probably need some kind of target model space. Uh, and this can be cartoonish, uh, but it's important for people outside of the field uh, to get a sense of, of where we're going. Uh, and then this last point is about the Dark Energy Task Force and how impactful that was, and whether we want to discuss something similar for, for dark matter probes. This could be uh, solely aligned to cosmic probes of dark matter physics, or it could be calling for something more general across the, the frontiers. I, I don't know. I'll leave that open for discussion. So I, I think those are the main points that I wanted to make. Um, so I will first check the chat because I see some, some chat messages here, and then we can open up to comments. Uh, yeah, so the there is no visual of the room. My camera is pointing in my direction. I think someone can take a picture and, and share Alex, it. Alex, I wrote that 25, 26 minutes ago. Yeah. So right, it's an it. out of date comment. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, John. OK. Um, opening up for questions and comments. I see Kyle. So I'll. So. Is this working? Um, so I have a, a, a few comments I'll start and then pass the baton. Um, but in terms of your, this is maybe a comment for the high level overview across all the cosmic frontier. Your executive summary with a bullet point for the need for simulations and your power spectrum slide actually couple very nicely to a, a, a debate or a discussion we're having within CF4 and specifically what you can glean from small scale clustering for growth of structure measurements. Um, if you look at that power spectrum as you go from whatever K of 0.01, where things are fairly linear, we can get tons of cosmological information. But then as you go towards K of one, you start sacrificing all of your clustering data to constrain these, these astrophysical nuisance terms. And if you just look at the two point statistics like that power spectrum, we don't know there's basically two point statistics and spectroscopy alone, you get nothing from growth of structure. So we need simulations, we need theory, uh, and we need development of techniques to, to cross different observables to remove those astrophysical terms. And it really spans nicely into exactly what you're showing here in CF3. So I just wanna say there's a very tight complementarity there. This whole continuum of, of baryonic physics so, and the need for simulations, which are really left out of Cosmic Frontier. Thanks, Kyle. And, and I would add on to that, the need for simulations in non-Lambda CDM as well. So the need for not only doing those simulations and the baryonic processes in CDM, but also in alternative cosmologies. 
Hi, uh, Priska here. I was just, um, I've been watching CF1, 2, and 3, and a lot of them are saying we need target models. And I'm wondering, actually, if this isn't the work has to be done for the summary above all of these, right? That we look at the whole picture and we pick um, a number of benchmarks from that. Um, this is sort of to Tim a little bit. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, it's going to be, there's a lot to put in these, and um, they do kind of provide, uh, you know, very different glimpses of different areas. And um, if you can find one, fine. But sometimes that, what that happens is other people whose, you know, particular interesting thing is not being chosen as your benchmark might complain. Whereas when you do it from a, on top by fiat, it's easier. I'm gonna check the chat message and then we'll go to Dan. Um, so I see a remark from, uh, I think that's Daniel Grin. Uh, quick remark on the plot showing small scale structure. I definitely think it is worth distinguishing dwarfs from Lima and alpha, nonlinear versus uh, nearly linear regimes. Uh, okay, and I see uh, Chanda asked to add that to Slack, great. And I will pass the baton to Dan. Thanks, Alex. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? Thanks. So yeah, so just a sort of reaction from, I don't know, outside, if that makes sense. But I mean, I feel like you guys started off with the feeling of, you know, a little bit defensive. We were left out previously. And so now we, but I think, I guess my, my reaction to this is, 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 maybe a way to articulate this message is that we'll, we'll never make sense of dark matter from three, you know, three nuclear scatters in a, in a liquid argon detector or liquid xenon, um, or, you know, finding a new particle at the LHC. And this is, this is a key leg of the stool, right? And it's every, every part as important as, as the other, the other legs that we're pursuing. M maybe that's a way to state it without sort of you know, putting off the other um, frontiers. Yeah, thank you. Hugh. For the dark matter task force, are you imagining that to be specific to CF3 or broader to all dark matter? Great question. Alex, can I step in here? Can people hear me? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I think in... Uh, the, there are real differences between the question that the dark energy task force had to address um, and the complexity of the model space at that time and the complexity of the dark matter model space that we are dealing with now. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. It, it would be a good discussion and it is a risk, right? Because if you organize such a task force, it at the end of the day, it gives you a very strong mandate that you can use to defend your ex experiments, uh, but it takes time and, yeah. Sorry. Um, I mean, I think it could be a really good idea, but the caution is not just about the time, it's also about is it possible for this science to do it in a way that fully captures the landscape? And how do we not get pushed into, you know, false uh, choices because of the specific figure of merit we come up with? Hey, uh, can you guys, Chandas or hand raise? I, as coming in from outside, I'm sort of baffled by what the need is perceived of having a dark matter task force. It, so maybe some of you who've been discussing it could elaborate a bit. Um, it seems like it's only <laughs> only trouble to me. Uh, thanks. Ch Chanda, I don't know if your uh, hand is up on this topic or another one. Yeah, I was trying to answer the question earlier, and I don't know if you just couldn't hear me when I spoke up. Can yeah, you sorry, you didn't. It, we can hear you now. Yeah, we did not hear you before. Sorry. Yeah, so I think in response to the question about the dark matter task force, I think that there are a couple of considerations. 
Um, I think naturally it would have to be not just a, a cosmic frontier um, topic. I don't think that that's sensible. So, and I think that the ideas that have been um, bandied about have focused on things that would involve interagency cooperation and encouraging interagency cooperation to the extent that people think that that idea is a good one. I think that there are real concerns that and I just am reiterating what Alex already said, <clears throat> I apologize, I have COVID, um, that it's possible that what how this ends up is that we get a task force, but we don't get money, and that this just basically shifts all of these conversations off by a decade or even longer. So um, I think that, you know, an idea that we have been uh, trying to get at without fully calling for a task force is potentially um, pushing for mechanisms that encourage interagency coordination with funding. So I want to encourage people to think creatively about going at it um, from, from that point of view um, and not necessarily from the point of view of something that mirrors the dark energy task force. And I just also want to highlight why mirroring the dark energy task force um, is potentially risky and encourages people to think that this problem is scientifically like the dark energy problem. And it is scientifically unlike the dark energy problem. And I don't mean that in a pejorative manner in either direction. They are just simply different problems. And um, it would be a mistake, I think, in either direction to adapt approaches for one problem to solving the other or encouraging people who are less familiar with our problem to think that it is that simple. So I think that that's something that we want to be cautious of. OK, I'm done. Thanks, Chanda. Um, I see David's hand. Hi, thanks. Yeah, so I, I, I do think there are different needs here. And, and when you um, floated the idea of a task force for uh, dark matter, I guess I immediately that immediately resonated me with that there, there is very much a need for this in the indirect dark matter searches. And the, the reason I'm saying that is whenever we're designing kind of the experiments that are being used for that, so like DESI or the imaging experiment, any of these things, then we ask, well, what does indirect dark matter need of the experiment? Like, would it help if for a, a spectroscopic survey, if the resolution were twice as good, we could give you velocities twice as good, whatever. And the answer is like, mm, don't know. We'll use whatever you got. Um, uh, well, that that's still the answer today, and I think you want a better answer than that. So, starting the process to, you know, I know people are working on this, but to really get to those answers um, would be great. And you don't want to wait another ten years so that Snowmass twenty thirty, we're still in this room asking these questions. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Natalie Rowe. And uh, just to follow up on what David said and also what Dan uh, said earlier, uh, in your first uh, few slides, you made the point that this uh, subgroup didn't exist in the last snow mass and that these experiments were proposed and are now uh, being built but you had a big X, they didn't check. I, I would say that's kind of the glass half empty perspective. The glass half full perspective might be, um, we didn't identify that at the time, but put a green check. The, these are actually very important experiments for this. And, and to David's point, for this snow mass, what, what is your input? What is your wish list for the next generation in terms of how future cosmic frontier experiments will be designed. So a more proactive approach, I would say, rather than saying, emphasizing that we were left out, uh, pointing out how you want to um, influence the process going forward. Yeah, thank you. So so that, just to cl be clear, that slide doesn't appear anywhere in our report. Uh, it's just been a contextual motivation throughout the snow mass process. I like the idea of replacing red X's with green checks. Um, and uh, we, we, do, we do have uh, a set of facilities that have come up through the snow mass process that could 
yield um, important information about dark, dark matter physics. Um, what we don't have is, as David was pointing out, uh, an apples to apples comparison of which facilities will provide which advancements and quantitatively how much advancement in each direction. And whereas uh, with dark energy, it was, you know, that it was possible to compress down to a figure, to, figure of merit that was rather simply defined. Uh, in this case, it's been challenging to decide, okay, are you interested in the smallest structures that you can measure? Are you interested in measuring the profiles of dark matter halos? Are you, each of these gets you at different kinds of dark matter, fundamental dark matter properties. Uh, and so there is no, or at least there has not come up through this process, a simple single figure of merit, which allows us to put these experiments, you know, the cosmic experiments all on the same framework, let alone put the cosmic probe experiments on a similar framework with the direct detection or the particle-like or wave-like direct detection experiments. Um, hopefully that gives a little context. Yeah, and, and if I can follow up on that, I don't know if you can hear me. We can hear uh, you, go ahead. Dan. Okay, great. Uh, so, you know, I've spent, uh, you know, over a decade being challenged by people at, you know, some friends at NASA and other places to think about a figure of merit, but uh, for dark matter, but like, you know, dark, dark matter is this case where we both know too little and too much to condense things to a figure of merit. So on the dark energy side, to be blunt, the figure of merit is constraining the first two terms of a Taylor series expansion because we just know so little. On the other hand, if we had some idea of what the the dark matter particle, if we had a single candidate, it would then also be straightforward to write down a figure of merit. But putting even WIMPs on one plot, like, you know, even say, as Pat said, for indirect detection, you know, we put annihilation to BB bar and W plus W minus, we have a whole bunch of different um, constraints that go on each plot. And it's just much for the reasons that other people have mentioned, um, it's just much, much harder to do that when you consider the ensemble of um, well-motivated dark matter candidates. So yeah, Thank that's you. just my two cents on that. Thanks, Annika. Coming back to the room. This is Benjamin Wallace. Um, Partly related to the fact that there weren't ticks and now there will be ticks. I think it was a lot of theorists that did that kind of did that work in, in order to get there. So calling that out and really emphasizing, possibly even more so for, for CF3 than the other CF1 and 2, how important it is to have theorists involved and funded to do that to, to do that work. I think that would be important uh, important to to call out. And then the second comment, um, you you mentioned the complementarity on the cosmological side with studies of inflation and dark energy, et cetera. Another axis might be also dark radiation, in particular in the context of dark matter and more extended models uh, that really could then further uh, kind of shed light on, onto dark matter itself. Yes, thank you. Good, good comment. I'm going up, uh, I saw maybe Hugh first and then Aaron, and then I see a chat message that I will look at. Um, another access that I'm sure you guys have thought about, I mean, the, the request here is not for instruments per se, right? It's for being able to do dark matter stuff with instruments that exist or will exist. I mean, it's in some sense it's parallel to the indirect detection in R and CF1 where the instruments are very broad and then you do dark matter things with them and that's what we need support for which couples back to sort of the larger research problems in high energy physics writ broadly. And I don't, you know, I don't, I don't have a point except to say that like, you know, it's, it's, it's not about building an instrument necessarily. Is that correct? Is my thinking about that right? So you are correct on bullet one. Uh, bullet two is actually proposing that there should be future facilities in the pipeline. 
where we are involved in the design and construction of those facilities. But I, I agree with what you're saying about the research budget on, on bullet one, for, certain, for sure. Uh, Aaron. Yeah, uh, concerning figures of merit, yeah, certainly there's different uh, science targets, uh, but for, for something like uh, uh, looking for a small scale structure that might be enhanced or suppressed by various dark matter models, uh, could, is, it, is it difficult to just make your best guess at uh, like what's the smallest size dark halo that you can see and uh, uh, what your statistics might be with uh, upcoming uh, telescopes? So in, in some cases, yes. In all cases, no. So, so there are different facilities at different levels of uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, maturity as far as being able to make those kinds of statements and projections. Uh, and so in some cases, yes, we can, we can do that for some subset of facilities. Uh, we can't do that for all facilities. Maybe that's OK. I think even your best guess at this time would be very useful just to prov provide some guidance. Thank you for that comment. And then uh, reading Ting's comment on the chat, if people can say their names uh, and affiliations, maybe, uh, to give people on Zoom a sense of who's talking. So the last two speakers were Aaron Cho from Fermilab and Hugh Lippincott from UC Santa Barbara. And I'm Alex Derlico-Wagner from Fermilab. Other comments? Mariana's had her hand up for a while and so has Dan. Uh, thank you, sorry. I am not seeing the hand raised. Uh, yeah, go, go ahead, Mariana. Hi, so I'm Mariana Safranova in University of Delaware. I am from the quantum sensor of wave-like dark matter community. And um, in recent years, there have been a lot of interesting ideas with dark matter halos around the sun, around the earth, uh, partially coming from the wave like dark matter community, but in principle, some of those are not uh, model specific. And there is also ongoing NASA decade of survey in DPS sciences. So I, I would be interested in what there are some, you know, even future ideas to probing dark matter distribution in the solar system in the sun vicinity because the current limits are extremely bad. For example, I, we were looking whether there there any paper constraining how much dark matter can one tolerate uh, within the sun vicinity. There is a single paper which is not uh, WIMP specific and the limits are something in the order of 5%, which uh, I found surprising. So the limits on the solar system dark matter are orders and orders of magnitude higher than um, normal halo dark matter. So I was just curious if there are any ideas of how sort of join the theoretical effort coming from wave like dark matter community with uh, efforts in uh, now more precision astrophysics in some future. Because that is very directly relevant for the detect direct detection experiment. And uh, also in terms of uh, some of the cosmic probes, it would be interesting to be more specific whether uh, the wave like dark matter are actually scalars, pseudo scalars, or vectors. And that will be very interesting to see if the distinction like this can be made to have it more model specific. And I would like to very much thank the CF3 community and the helping with the CF2 uh, white papers uh, on this topic. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, would anyone like to? Uh try to address either of, of those questions. If not, I can try. <laughs> so um, there, there was uh, some discussion within uh, the facilities paper about uh, precise uh, uh, ephemerides for solar system bodies being used to constrain you know, non-GR gravitational influences, which could be extended to, to dark matter uh, within the solar system. Um, uh, beyond that, um, I have, I did not encounter much discuss discussion of this, but perhaps someone who's been familiar with this work wants to comment. Uh, 
I am actually involved in this uh, somewhat with some of the newer work. And uh, my question more of going beyond this to have more of a dedicated ideas, both theory modeling and perhaps even future NASA missions. I see, thank you. Um, yeah, we, we can write that in the uh, in the notes and maybe follow up with you. I think this maybe follows falls generally into the uh, suggestion for uh, additional support mechanisms for combining theory with uh, with people in other disciplines and supported by other agencies. Um, Daniel, I see your hand is up. Yeah, um, I think uh, Aaron Cho already said part of what I was going to say or hinted at it with the question. Could we click back on the slides uh, just a little bit? There was a nice target potential target for a figure of merit, and I go back a bit more. Oh, um, yeah, 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 right there. Uh, <laughs> there was a big blob. Uh, yeah, there we go. So e even though the free streaming scale, right, is um, it's a misnomer for fuzzy dark matter, but but I think I know what we mean. Seems like area in this plane um, is potentially a good um, figure of merit. Um, one thing that's worth considering that's kind of fallen short here that I think some people alluded to is in some of the fuzzy dark matter and other models, as we can see on the plot on the left, there's also boosted power scenarios. Um, so it might be interesting to kind of think of a, a version of this plot that can somehow capture enhanced power um, on small scales, just something for folks to think about. But isn't area in this plane kind of a useful metric. It's observationally driven. Um, and at the end of the day, that's kind of what we're after, right? What can we measure? Would this be a good figure of merit right here on the right? That's kind of my question. Right, so maybe, so in order to move to an experimental figure of merit, where you would be comparing experiment one, the reach of one experiment to another, uh, you we would need to translate sort of sensitivity to cut off scale onto this figure and or and I I think you we would probably find that in some cases uh, power spectrum cutoff is not the most sensitive avenue to explore some of these models um, and so yeah we would need to workshop this a little more I, li I like the way this idea is going but it hasn't quite clicked for me. Yeah, another thing I might worry about is it, it, I could be wrong about this, but it seems to me that any given experiment is going to clip a tiny part of this plane. Um, so maybe we should be ex ex assessing programs rather than individual experiments using this figure of merit, because it seems like everything would look terrible on this figure. <laughs> Can I just make a comment about figures of merit in general? And this, yes, please. It's just, this is just linking back to what I was saying earlier about how this is scientifically a different problem. Um, I think that one of the challenges that we particularly face in um, with dark matter broadly as a topic, but specifically with astrophysical probes or cosmic probes as we're calling them here uh, of dark matter is that this is not a single parameter space. Um, as is sometimes the case with other particle physics problems. And so I think that there's an element of needing to reconfigure the bureaucracy to reflect how the scientific problem actually stands, as opposed to trying to make the scientific problem reflect um, the, the typical um, mores of, of prior bureaucracies. So I think that part of the task that's before us with the writing and with the communication is to say that we need structures that enable us to pursue the scientific problem before us, as opposed to we need to make our, the scientific problem before us fit into um, a slim configuration of, or a configuration of a scientific problem that doesn't actually suit the problem that we are dealing with. So I, I don't think that it is necessarily a problem that a single figure, of, that this is not necessarily a single figure of merit scientific problem. Um, it is a, a technical challenge for us to present it bureaucratically, but I hope that we can separate that from um, the scientific problem before us. And I just think that that 
um, can seem really scary, but it's also an opportunity because it means that we are moving in an interesting direction scientifically. Thank you, Chanda. Okay, um, other comments? I see David Schlegel. All right, just since we keep coming back to the DETF, the, 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 the task force idea, that shouldn't be considered, the fact that that came out with this very simple figure of merit um, method, that's probably not what a dark matter task force would come up with. And, and so I just wouldn't, I wouldn't assume that it comes up with something simple like that. I think it, it would be something more appropriate. I don't know what it is. Thank you. Okay, uh, I see we have five, five minutes left. Uh, Hugh. Hugh cut again. I, I guess on the, the figure of merit comment, I mean, the last three hours we've been talking about trying to make these figures and you know all of our snow mass efforts have failed to make one figure so far that is acceptable even within our single working groups so it's definitely a difficult problem <laughs> like i'm not sure this in some sense this is a task force and we've known that this is a goal and we are still thinking about it right right that, that's why we're pushing it all to tim Okay, other Aaron Cho. I, I just wanted to make a comment on the figure that's on the left. Um, so it's great, it, it shows that there's a lot of interesting models uh, that, that are shown on the plot, uh, but I also see the data on the plot uh, end at uh, a wave number of, uh, of about 10 uh, per megaparsec. Uh, and then I see all the interesting stuff is happening like uh, at resolutions that are five or six orders of magnitude finer than what we currently have. And so I wonder if this plot is sending the right message if you don't expect to achieve uh, five to six orders improvement in resolution. Uh, and if that's the case, it might be worth it to kind of uh, <laughs> remove the parts that uh, aren't likely to be achieved uh, on the 10 year time scale or at any time scale in the future and then focus on what you can see, which is the fuzzy dark matter uh, and some of the warm dark matter scenarios. Thanks for that, that comment. I think in some ways there is the balance between the overall statement of opportunity versus uh, current technical capability that should be balanced. So, so yeah, currently we are in, we have ideas to probe sort of this domain and there are ideas to potentially probe this domain and they're, they're separate uh, experimental facilities. Yeah, yeah. Is that a hand from Kyle? So also related to this figure, and then again, this is a question that spans Cosmic Frontier, maybe go to the theory group, but a lot of these signatures that are in here, this oscillatory behavior is, I believe, degenerate with some of the early inflation physics that can introduce similar signals, um, changes in the inflationary field. And I'm curious if anyone in the theory group has a way to explain that either in a positive way or in, a, you know, or, or in, in some way to address the what looks to me like a little bit of degeneracy between some of the things we're probing for inflation versus this dark matter. Is there anyone, any of the theory group here? Okay, last, uh, last chance for, for comments in this session. Otherwise, we will start doing the handover to CF4. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for, for your comments, your continued uh, effort on this work. It really wouldn't be possible without contributions for a from a lot of, a lot of people. 
Uh, and so thank you, thank you again for that. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we'll start doing the changeover to uh, CF4 now. Okay. Your dongle or so these are mine, but I think How this will work for you. Oh no no HDMI uh, that is Hughes. I mean, there's no camera. Oh, they have an iPad. Yeah. I brought I brought an external camera, and then I don't know where it went in the interim. Like somewhere between my dorm room and here, it disappeared. <laughs> So there is a pretty mad rush to get stuff set up. Right now. Okay. Okay. Can someone on the line speak up? Can anyone hear me? I hear you. That wasn't bad. Um, so people Can you hear, hear me. Us now? Yeah, that was a little loud. Speak again. Hi, Jeff. It's Renee. Great. Uh, so I think we're all set up. Just so, just to note that uh, you are quite so, uh, soft. I was soft. Um, You're better when the microphone is quite close to your mouth. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can adjust the input volume now. Okay. It's it's turned on. It looks like. Um, okay. Well, I'll just hold it real close. Um, all right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, so I'm happy to talk about uh, the draft report uh, from CF04, uh, which we are, our focus is dark energy and cosmic acceleration in the modern universe. But as you'll see, uh, we're really interested in a lot of science that goes beyond that, that we get simultaneously from the same projects. Um, and the conveners of this group are uh, Jim Annis, myself, and Anja Slozar. Uh, let me minimize this so it's not blocking us. All right. Uh, and oh, there's chat. Uh, let's see. Okay, that's not me. Okay. Let's see if I can move this. Sorry. There we go. All right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Jim. Uh, is so thanks. Um, I have no idea who the host is. All right, so where do we stand? 
uh, we circulated last week uh, the draft of the Cosmic Frontier 4 summary report. Uh, so what do we need? Uh, first of all, if you go through that draft, you'll notice there's some sections that need some copy editing. Uh, that's you know a day or two of work. I, I'm quite sure that's not a problem. Uh, but what we really need is input from you all, from the community. Um, so what are we missing in this report? We need to know so we can add it. Um, what ways can we make the argument stronger? That'll help us. Um, and what figures will help make the case? I'll, I'll, if we have time, I'll walk through the figures we have in here. Uh, but if there are additional figures that would make the case better, that would be important too. Um, and uh, of course, this all feeds into the case for Cosmic Frontier Science uh, going forward at the workshop. Um, so I'll summarize what's in there uh, to help guide you through the report. Uh, we're quite happy to get feedback after this meeting, not just at this meeting. Um, so we, we open with basically what are the key open questions uh, in the modern universe, not just of dark energy, but extending beyond. You know, we, we have this mystery of what the dark energy is, uh, but one lesson from recent experiments is we get constraints on many other compelling questions at the same time. So we get tests of gravity. We get measurements of neutrino masses. We get tests of inflation models. Uh, we get tests potentially from these experiments of early dark energy that may be uh, involved in a Hubble tension. We get constraints on dark rad radiation. Uh, and we also have a lot of means of exploring sigma-8 tensions that have also shown up and CF7 is talking about. Um, and the really exciting thing about the experiments that have been discussed in CF4 is many of them address a, a wide variety of the science simultaneously. So we'll get constraints on uh, the time evolution of dark energy, of acceleration, but a lot of other science at the same time. Um, and so we introduced that in the executive summary and section 4.2 of the report really focuses on those questions uh, that we find interesting. Um, Section 4.3 is really about the, the landscape of, of current and near future experiments, things that haven't finished uh, producing data or, or in analyzing their data. So the Dark Energy Survey, BOSS, EBOSS, and now DESI feeding into each other. Uh, the VRC Rubin Observatory LSST is going to be important over the next decade. Uh, and we also give a little bit of context of the space-based missions that are also important for understanding cosmic acceleration, even though they're not our focus on the science. Um, and so there's sort of four themes that input coalesced around. Um, so, and two of those have to do with the science that we could do with large spectroscopic surveys. So building on the legacy of BOSS and EBOSS, DESI is doing this now, but there's a lot of room to take another step uh, into a stage five. Um, and so there's sort of two domains that, that have complementary science. Uh, one is measurements at lower redshift, lower being Z less than 1.5. I would have called that high redshift when I was in grad school, but uh, lower redshift uh, where we could get samples with very high density uh, and get very good constraints on nonlinear scales. Uh, and because we'll have very dense samples with very different galaxy properties, we get a lot of cross checks and systematics checks uh, that are powerful. And the other domain is at higher redshifts where we can sample larger and larger volumes of the universe and explore structure on the largest scales, uh, linear scales, which are important, for instance, for understanding inflation and testing inflation models. Um, and there's a strong case for what we're calling a stage five spectroscopic facility, same, same things being discussed in CF3, uh, CF6, um, which would give us strong constraints on Cosmic acceleration basically from Z of 0.1 to four, maybe five, maybe six, uh, probably not six, um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but would also give us a lot of other science. It would do CF3 science simultaneously, just with different targets. Uh, it would give us stronger constraints from Rubin Observatory if you, if you take the right strategies. Um, it would give us a lot of these constraints on things like inflation. Um, and I, I will also note, uh, so DESI is still the most powerful instrument of its type. Um, it can't do all of these things simultaneously, but can do a part of this science. And it can play a role in prototyping methods also for stage five facilities. 
Um, and so section 4.4 of the report really focuses on these two areas that could potentially have a very high impact. Um, so the next uh, sort of theme is that there's a variety of smaller scale, but very exciting programs that can exploit telescopes all the way from small telescopes, one meter telescopes up to the ELTs um, that can increase the constraining power of the stage four imaging service of LSST and get us more for our money from LSST at a, at a modest investment. Um, and so, you know, close to my heart is the idea of photometric redshift training uh, and calibration spectroscopy. This is going to be the limiting factor in a lot of cosmic frontier science from LSST. We do better on this, LSST gets better. Um, so at the same time, we can pursue constraints on intrinsic alignments, which is an important systematic for weak lensing. Supernova follow-up increases the value of all the supernovae from LSST. And there's a project tides, they'll do this for five years during foremost, but LSST is a 10 year program. So we've got five years of gap. Um, strong lensing follow-up, actually ELTs are really good for, they do it really, really fast and give us a lot of information. Um, so there's value in low redshift supernova peculiar velocity studies that can do things like test uh, modified gravity theories at Z less than 0.1, where the spectroscopic surveys uh, are less effective. Uh, Follow-up of standard sirens, eventually that could be a dark energy probe. Um, and uh, a, a key open question is, what do we do with the VRC Rubin Observatory after LSST? It'll still be the most powerful facility of its class. We don't yet know what LSST will find. Uh, so we're advocating for about five years from now to evaluate what the best role for LSST, for Rubin Observatory would be. Um, we don't know the answer yet, I would say. And so sections 4.5, 4.6, and 4.7 of the report talk about these aspects. And then the last uh, area where, where we have a sort of a continuum theme is uh, we want to enable the next generation past the stage, stage five spectroscopic facility. Um, and instrumental R&D is involved there. And one aspect that actually helps those spectroscopic facilities, if we can miniaturize fiber positioners, any of the concepts people put forward for those stage five facilities get strong. And so uh, that's a case where a small investment could actually yield a lot of yield, increase in constraining power. But there's also the very, very, uh, uh, clever ideas of, of things like ways to improve the precision of wavelength measurements so that you can measure redshift drift uh, sooner than you would have expected. Uh, and uh, uh, astrometry measurements with precision, which can enable probes of, of dark matter uh, as well as, as acceleration. Um, so astrometry being positioned on the sky as opposed to redshift. Um, so intensity mapping, uh, is going to be tested in, in some regimes by SphereX. Um, there's ideas of very powerful surveys extending past Redshift 5 uh, in the radio that use intensity mapping, but there's a lot of open questions and how you deal with foregrounds and on and on. And so that's an area where R&D now is really needed to enable future projects uh, if that, that's successful, um, but with a high payoff if it is. Um, and so section 4.8 of the report focuses on that. Um, and so what's the story that, that uh, we see, see is, is you know, our message to the rest of SNOMAS is really that the questions we can answer start with dark energy, but don't end there. Um, the same experiments are, are powerful uh, at testing you know, the evolution of, of acceleration over time, all the way back to Z of five or six. We get tests of gravity uh, with you know, strong systematics checks out uh, to redshift 1.5 and beyond uh, to test alternative explanations for acceleration. Uh, we get precision measurements of neutrino masses from these experiments. Uh, we get constraints on dark radiation and early dark energy, uh, dark energy at Z of 500 and above. We can constrain with data at Z less than five, which I think is really amazing. Um, so we get constraints on inflation models, searching for features in the power spectrum, testing for non-Gaussianity. Uh, we get a lot of handles on the matter power spectrum, which are important for addressing whether these sigma eight tensions that people are talking about, uh, tensions in the measured amplitude of the, the power spectrum of matter bit fluctuations, uh, 
whether that's real, how that, if it is real, how it evolves with retro. And we're building on a really uh, exciting progression of experiments. We've had DES, now DESI, uh, which, you know, we're, we're, we're pr producing data at a tremendous rate or kill the fire, uh, but we will continue. Um, so LSST is coming online in just a couple of years or less. SphereX, Euclid, and Roman will give us uh, uh, complementary probes from space, which you combine those with the ground-based projects we're doing in high energy physics, you get stronger information. Uh, so they're, they're a part of, of making everything better. And this program has really grown out of the 2013 snow mass. And uh, we're really, we're at the point where we're starting to see results in that 2013 snow mass. And I, you know, I hope that, you know, nine years from now, we'll be starting to see results from today, right? Um, and so, you know, Ruben, what to do with Ruben is part of that. We don't know what Ruben will be good at until we start seeing data, right? And so basically where the roadmap is from, from the community input is, you know, long run, hopefully we see something physical a decade from now, if not before, we have a stage five spectroscopic facility builds on the LSST data, but uh, takes us into a new precision domain for a lot of science. Um, so shorter run, uh, we've got a wide spectrum of, of programs on a variety of scales that can improve our understanding of cosmic acceleration and other cosmology in this era. And we have the continuing need for instrumental R&D to continue to enable next generation projects and you know, both uh, at a wide variety of scales. So we can have a broad portfolio. Um, so the questions we have for you all is first of all, what comments you have on the report? Uh, we've circulated it. Uh, I circulated again today, so everyone has hopefully easy access. Um, we'd like to understand what we're missing in that report. And um, you know, had discussions with Jim already today. You know, maybe we we, we need to talk more about. Uh, the need for better theory, as, as Kyle talked about a little bit in the last session. Uh, progress on theory can really be important, particularly at this Z less than 1.5 regime. Um, so how do we make the arguments in the report stronger? You know, we've got a first draft. I don't want it to be the final draft. I want to have a better report at the end of this. Um, and then what figures would help make our case? I'll show you the figures we have, uh, particularly if, if there's Time, I'll open the floor for questions a little first, and then we can talk about figures. Uh, can we make any of those figures better? That'd be great. Uh, are there any figures we should add? That'd be great too. And really it's these connections to the other uh, topical groups and frontiers where I think there's a lot of room to build. So CF3, CF6, uh, making sure we have a unified message, a lot of the same programs, facilities that would be important for CF4, are important for CF3 as well. Uh, so theory, computing, instrumentation, the community engagement frontier, we, we haven't incorporated it as much into our report as we could. And suggestions, ideas of how to do that would be very welcome. Um, and, uh, you know, continue, uh, uh, you know, I'm hoping you all have a lot of feedback today, but, you know, Jim and I are here most of the week, uh, continue to, to give us feedback. Let's, let's make this report better. So, uh, I'll ask, are there any immediate uh, questions, comments before we walk through figures and all that? So just a follow-up question to my comment. Sorry. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, I'm Kyle Dawson. Um, a follow-up question to what I asked or commented on CF3. Has there been any communication between you and the theory group about like what are their priorities and how do they align with the developments that are needed in here? And I'm really again specifically thinking about whether it's you know EFT models or computing to really get a better understanding of nonlinear and baryonic processes. I would say mostly those connections haven't happened, but need to. Uh, Eric Linder has been active in CF4. I think he's this, the closest to a liaison to the theory, uh, uh, the theory activities going on. 
And on the computing side, Katrine Heitman has been engaged. Uh, and so she's been thinking about those things, but I, I think that hasn't really been reflected in the report. And that, that's really reflecting the white papers, the, the, the major white papers we had. Um, but uh, we, sh we should go beyond those white papers, I would say. I mean, not to criticize myself, but the white paper that Katrina and I and Andrew put together really was limiting in this regard. It, it, that was a shortcoming and we didn't have that connection to theory and, and it would be nice to at some point fill that out. Other questions or comments in the room? So Jim, is there anything on Zoom? Okay. Um, with regard to the stage four, uh, sorry, stage five spectroscopic instrument, I mean, uh, it's great. <laughs> it should happen. Um, but how do we get there in terms of number one, making the case as strong and punchy and clear as possible, um, synergizing between sort of CF4, CF3, CF5 case, and also making it a little more clear, you know, there's different proposals on the table about what that instrument might be? Do we have a way to evaluate them in these science goals? So uh, Andre wanted us to potentially discuss that. So I actually, there's a section of the report on that uh, that I put on a slide. So I'll go to my last slide. Um, so, and this is of course, feedback on our thoughts here are very valuable. Um, but basically, we looked at what would maximize the impact on cosmic frontier science, and this would be true for CF3 as well. Um, so, you know, Aton do is important if you want to do wide field surveys. Um, uh, a point Kyle's made uh, before is that the, the focal plane area is very important because that, that determines your multiplex. And if you really want to do the CF3 science, and both of these CF4 science cases simultaneously, you need a lot of fibers per square degree. And so that uh, optimizes your capabilities. Um, we need spectral coverage to get the features we need. We need to split the oxygen to doublet. Um, we would like as large a collecting area as we can get. If you can give us a 40 meter, seven square degree field of view telescope, that'd be great. Uh, that's not gonna happen, but uh, you know, we, we want, larger collecting area so we can look at fainter targets. Um, and ideally, we'd like to be in the Southern Hemisphere uh, to cover the Rubin Observatory footprint because that's the perfect target selection survey uh, for these programs. Um, but then we say, you've got to weigh that into how much fund against how much funding you have along with other partners. Uh, we don't think any of these would probably be pursued by HEP on its own. So other partners would be needed. Um, so how much time would actually go to cosmic frontier science is a consideration. If only 10% is going to cosmic frontier science, it's like having one tenth of the collecting area basically, right? So, so that's a matter. Um, and uh, also the time scale, because if we'd get a perfect machine in 2050, you know, I don't want to wait till 2050. Um, so we have to weigh these against each other. And so maybe there's considerations we haven't thought of, that'd be great. Maybe there's ways we should prioritize this. Feedback on that might be useful too. Um, but that's the start of thinking about this. Um, and uh, you know, one, one continuing message is there's multiple ideas for how to do a stage five facility, right? You know, the, the proposals that came to us are the Mega Magma, the Mauna Kea Spectroscopic Explorer and the European Spectel concept. Um, and you know, we're not saying you know, only one of these is the option. We have to, you know, they all have trade-offs in this space. And we have to evaluate those trade-offs. Um, it's premature to say one of them is the best answer. I, I think it is clear to me. Um, P5 starts to think about those questions. Um, other thoughts, comments, or thoughts on this part of the report?
I'm Julian Guy from LBL. So with respect to the discussion we had in the previous session, so you have numbers here about resolution, fiber density, uh, mirror size. It would be really interesting to know what would be the optimal for uh, dark matter uh, topics. It's pretty similar. The halo star densities are, you know, of order a thousand per square degree you'd be interested in, right? Uh, Alex can answer a lot better than me though. Yeah, so so I, I think what we want to do, I don't know if Ting Lee is still on, on the line, but she wrote a, a really good paper for MSE, looking at MSE and the reach for that. And I think it is general enough that we could extract the numbers that we would need from, from that uh, and the reach from that and extend it to be, you know, somewhat generic scaling as, as a function of mirror size and, and fiber density and things like that, yeah. It'd be really great to do all these projects at once and not have to worry about trade-offs. And there, there are concepts on the table that could potentially do that, I would say. Um, other questions, comments here? Okay, uh, so then I'll go to the figures. Give you all a chance to give feedback on this. So this is the first... Uh, Figure, this is um, showing uh, basically the primordial figure of merit was introduced by one of, uh, one of the uh, white papers we received. Um, and the idea is basically counting the number of uh, power spectrum modes a given experiment observes. And uh, this curve is just showing the emission line galaxy sample from DESI at lower redshift. The other samples are more constraining. Um, but because there's not much volume at low redshift, the number of power spectrum modes available are limited, which is a lot of the driver pushing to these higher redshift numbers. Um, and so, so, so sorry, uh, sorry, just to correct you, uh, uh, um, Jeff, uh, it, it's the linear power spectrum modes, right? So the K max is not infinity, but it says by the, well, it's it's all done correctly weighting, but roughly thinking it, right? Think it's a linear power spectrum mode, just the power spectrum mode. So, so Andre, while you're on the line, do you have anything to add to anything I said before uh, while you're talking? No, I think you're doing great. <laughs> okay. Uh, I should say Jim too, if you ever have anything to say, please. Uh, um, okay. Uh, so it's trying to illustrate that, uh, you know, we have curves for a couple of these stage five facilities. Uh, and also these ranges are for a couple of concepts of 21 centimeter intensity mapping experiments that we further down the line. Um, but we have the potential to get to, you know, a fair fraction of the cosmic variance limit from these future experiments, um, which is a, a really important opportunity, a lot of the driver for these high redshift surveys. Um, any comments or suggestions on this figure? Marcelli. I'm going to get my exercise today. What is limiting, you know, the um, the shape of the curve in these scenarios? I think it's to have the area. So the shape of the curve is driven; it flattens out because the samples are becoming more limited. So once once you reach the redshift limit for your sample, so for instance, the Desi ELGs are mostly less than Z of one point five, so the curve becomes flat at that point. So that's what's flattening it out: is you're just whatever a given sample samples a range of redshifts. And, and it's also logarithmic wide scale, right? This also kind of, you know, the volume only grows, whatever's uh, third power, and this is logarithmic. But think, but think that this curve correctly takes into account the short noise, the volume, and the fact that basically universal high redshift is more linear, okay? So, I mean, we could argue about various traces, but it, no, it's, 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 it's a figure of math of some kind. No. But I think I think the right thing to think about it is a lot of science that depends simply on on the number of linear modes, including FNL, including BS sensitivity, at some approximate level, and and so on, are just directly proportional to whatever this line study. And this is straight taken from the uh, from one of the submitted white papers. Um, Hugh Lippincott. Um, so this is an outsider question. Um, a, who is the audience for this plot? And B, if the audience is to outsiders, I don't know what primordial figure of merit means or is trying to get at or what the target is in this plot. 
So that's the question. That's a good one for you to answer, Anja, since you're on the white paper. Yeah, okay, so so the bit of history here, just to give you context, is that there is this famous dark energy figure of merit. And here by figure of merit, really, it really says what's in the can. It's basically, when you compare experiments, the one that has higher figure of merit is supposed to be better. It's supposed to be kind of some sort of uh, a, attempt to kind of have a single number that, re, that just tells you the relative ability to experiments. And, and of course, you know, experiments probe different things. They have different systematics. It's, you know, it's very hard to kind of, you know, uh, uh, there are caveats, right? You, can, you cannot co compress all the information with single experiments to a single number, right? But nevertheless, dark energy figure of merit used to be, used, was very successful in promoting experiments uh, in the past decade uh, to, to facilities and so on, just saying, look, this new experiment will just, uh, improve the dark energy figure of merit. So this is the context here. We're trying to come up with a new figure of merit um, that will kind of, because we feel the dark energy figure of merit has outlived its purpose, um, simply because you know, dark energy authority will be measured you know, to some extent okay. well enough. Uh, so primordial, yeah. primordial in this primordial figure of merit uh, refers to primordial, primordial physics, things like the properties of inflation um, and, 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 and stuff like that. That's 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 roughly the story. So so the, the idea is this is something that if you have a proposal that says, look, it's going to double the model figure of marriage respect to what it's now, it should kind of sound appealing to the agencies. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, a very good point here is, you know, a lot of people will just look at the figures and the captions and, uh, you know, we should make sure this caption tells that story. Uh, that's a very good point, yeah. yes. That's a very good point, yeah, thank you. I, I know, and I, I, it's kind of very useful to get this feedback from people who are outside the field who, don't know what we're talking about. Right? Just, just a super minor follow-up. Like one idea would be to put just tar target thresh example thresholds that will be reached with this, like some FNL value or some, you know, neutrino. Mass that's a, that's a very good that point. Yeah, so that people can see see what that means. Thanks. Yeah. That the 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 the, the auto kind of uh, closed captions tells me about ethanol <laughs> limits. So yeah, we'll, we'll try to, that's right. I think FNL should give, should pro correspond to band here of some kind, FNL of one. So I think I think it is something we should we should attempt to put here. Yeah. If we're talking about this figure in particular, I think for DZ, we have also a Quasar program. I mean, we should have a second curve that extends to HF3. So. That, that, that's right. The, 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 and it's known that there is, I think it's additional bug uh, in this figure. And I think Jeff has already kind of hassled uh, Sailor to, to give yeah, an updated that's, figure. Yeah, right extend it's it's even making, we'll update this. I think it's actually interesting to see how close we are to cosmic variance at lower Z. But, uh, uh, Michael Levy here. Well, I think it would be useful to put the DESI2 curve on here. I think we've talked about it. Um, certainly, we can probably go up to you know, Z max of four, uh, I mean, uh, uh, at least in terms of how this is defined. It certainly won't be as you know, capable as, as mega map or spectel, but I think it's useful to have it on the curve. Thanks. That's a good idea. And Noah should be capable of doing that. He's involved in those discussions. Uh, uh, <laughs> Hi, Alex Kim, LBL. Um, I think the point may be that maybe figure one should be more science driven. Um, it's going to be something that the non-experts are going to be looking at. Um, it should be highlighting dark energy, well, actually the things that you showed in your first slide, dark energy, modified gravity, et cetera, et cetera. And this figure of merit is a very important figure of merit, but it's not the only figure of merit that's involved in this domain. Yeah, one, one thing we lack right now is sort of an H of Z plot with error bars. And if we could have that, I think that would be very interesting. Um, other... Yeah, so let, let me just add that at the moment, uh, we should, I mean, what the way we approach this is kind of simply take figures from the from the submitted white papers. And yeah, I do agree, we probably need a few more introductory high level figures, which, or maybe even cartoons, if not quite uh, figures that, that will kind of bring this point home, yes. Other thoughts, comments on this one? Well, I'll just point out we have been making measurements to date. So, on any of these, this and the following figures, there are, in this case, this is just upper limits, the others, it's measurements, but um, you know, what we've done with BOSS, EBOSS, and so forth. 
Um, I did want to bring up another point now, just while I have the mic, sorry, which is uh, that for all these figures, one, two, three, where you're going at the science, um, it doesn't quite match the top level recommendations you have where you talk about it's the, lo the low redshift measurements and the high redshift measurements. So low redshift measurements aren't actually feeding into any of these. And I, yeah. I, I wish they were because we actually have the perfect instrument to do that already, which would be DASI. So I'd, I would love that to be the case, but I, I don't think it is. Yeah, and this is reflecting the figures in the white papers, but this is part of why I wanted to have an illustration of how close to you know the cosmic variance limit we are at low Z and how much we'd push it. Um, but uh, and an H of Z plot could contribute there potentially. You know, we could have an example of sort of what is it post Desi and what it would be after stage five or something like that. The the hard part is we are near the cosmic variance limit in linear modes, but what's suggested in the Z less than one point five section is to go saturate the information at the nonlinear scales. So that almost by definition is in conflict with this. Not, I actually like this, by the way, but that's almost in, by definition in conflict with this portrayal. One thing we could do is have a plot at K of 0.2 or something like that. Uh, of you know, it's not the integral like this, but or you know, an integral of a K range uh, at, at smaller scales. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, at least gives you something that you can interpret both plots with some similarity. I don't know if Noah would be outfitted to do that, but if so, it might be nice. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking two parallel plots or something like that, so they're parsable. But uh, yeah, uh, I think it would be great to have to show what we gain from the, the lower Z sample, I agree. Um, so Joel Myers is making a comment about how unnatural excluded by cosmic variance is. And maybe he perhaps wants to speak up on it. Yeah, really, really minor point. It's just the phrasing. Um, so excluded by cosmic variance sounds like you're ruling in or out a model. Um, whereas in the caption, it says cosmic variance limit, which just seems more natural for this, for this figure of merit, but it's just phrasing. Well, yeah, unavailable you're right. Due to cosmic variance? Basically impossible to reach, well, impossible to exceed by cosmic variance. I want the right way to put it, right? Right. Okay. Good. Some good, good, good thoughts here. Um, and I hope volunteers to help push in these directions. Okay, so the second figure. Uh, again, Sorry, but by the way, is, is anybody taking notes? Jim, are you perhaps taking some notes about these comments? Or it's uh, maybe it's recording, right? So we can get to them later. Well, it's right? recording, but Jim is taking notes. Ah. <laughs> so be careful what you say. Um, okay, so this, this is also drawn from this high Z light white paper. Um, it, you know, it does actually give us a distance versus redshift or an H of Z curves, uh, but really focused on the high Z regime, we, we, we want to see something that extends to low Z, I think, uh, possibly ex adding points here, possibly something a little different, um, showing that even these, these uh, optical surveys, uh, there are proposals that they would give sub percent constraints on the distance scale uh, out to Z of five. Um, which is pretty much the limit of what we call the modern universe for this uh, for this group, um, and uh, so that's uh, you know that that's potentially exciting. Uh, the twenty one centimeter experiments uh, do better, of course, with angular modes than than line of sight modes. Yeah. I mean, uh, the useful uh, maybe. I mean, if we get Sailor to to do this, the right thing would be to actually add, as David said, the existing limits. You know, where <laughs> what we actually already measured, right, uh, to the left of this plot, and maybe the yeah. I had a comment. 
following on Michael's comment, I just emailed you numbers that you can place in this for Desi 2. I emailed those to you this morning or last night, but we, we have forecasts. Okay, we have forecasts exactly in this lane for specific areas and specific number of densities. Uh, okay, good. So we have the potential then to add on the low redshift simultaneously here. Um, we might even want to break this up more, I don't know, to, to, to focus on distance and H separately. I don't know if that would be useful. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the Z less than 1.5, I think we want to, right? Oh, oh, that's why it's that shape. Yeah. I, okay, but I think it would be very interesting to have those numbers and have DESI numbers and you know, dense samples numbers, you know, some fiducial high, high density sample. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I would just take issue again with the high density sample at low Z and that it, it's, it's not backed up. It's not something we would do today because we don't know it would be useful. On the other hand, there are white paper submissions of, um, I mean, what this is ignoring here is like the Hubble tension at low redshift, which naturally goes into figures like this. Um, and, you know, that's other measurements. It's from you know, supernovae or whatever else. And I, th I think we really want to be seeing that here. This is Benjamin Wallace. Uh, I'm wondering with the previous figure I already mentioned and also here, if a, if a non-cosmologist looks at these plots, they're wondering, well, they, they probably recognize H of C as, as Hubble but what alpha, DS alphas are and kind of DA, uh, and they, they don't know why they should be caring about these plots. So I think they should probably be more accessible, at least at least in terms of, uh, kind of explaining the, the, the axis, but potentially even kind of making some different plots that do showcase these experiments, but in, in a way that, that's accessible. And adding, I think, punchlines in the captions for each of these figures too, that sort of what you should come away with, I think might be valuable. Um, other thoughts on these panels? Okay. Um, so again, this is drawn from, uh, from the, the same white paper on the high Z uh, samples, um, summarizing uh, different facilities, their figure of merit, uh, some estimate of their capabilities, although uh, some of these are moving targets. Um, so uh, uh, any comments, thoughts on this table, uh, probably best to do offline. I think rather than trying to read the prime print on a slide, uh, but uh, this is here, or if there's columns we should add, that might be useful feedback. I guess continuing the chain, DESI2 should probably be on here, right? Yeah, so by the way, Michael Levy and David Schlegel, do we have like a definite kind of uh, straw person for, so I figure for DZ2. I think we could make a straw man redshift distribution, couldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I, it's fine to have something new in the report. I think that's there's plenty of precedent for that. I'm not worried about that. Um, uh, Kevin Huffenberger. Um, I just, uh, it's a little bit in a different spirit, but you could have um, SE clusters. It's maybe harder to compare, but if you're making a list of all of the acceleration probes, 
Cluster abundances and SZ is talked about uh, actually as part of the follow-up with, with Rubin Observatory clusters as well uh, for spectroscopic uh, measurements of them as being the new need. Uh, but uh, I think we're, we're, we are, you know, CMBS4 gives us, and, you know, gives us dark energy constraints in the modern universe through SZ. So that's not something we're talking about right now. And uh, I think that's, that's an important point. This is Benjamin again. Um, as the, C, uh, the CMB was just brought up, uh, how much communication has there been between CF4, 5, and 6, potentially 7, uh, to have like a coherent message in terms of uh, this is the science you want to address? And then I understand then the, the papers or the, the different groups and focus on different uh, observations, but at least that the, the science itself is coherent over okay, in all the groups and then the, the kind of cosmology is, is represented then also in the, with inflation that not, not only to beyond dark matter, dark radiation, all, all, of, the, all of that uh, in the high level CF report. Yeah, I, uh, I, I very much think that to the degree we, we agree on those questions and are, have a common message, it, it strengthens the cosmic frontier impact. Um, and there, there are areas where we've been influenced by what CF7 is talking about, certainly. So things like the focus on tensions, current tensions, is, is an area they've been thinking about a lot. Uh, and so we have tried to highlight where we could contribute to that uh, with these same experiments that, that, that work on dark energy. Um, I don't know if Jim or Anja have more to say on that. No. But, but yeah. I, I, th I think the, the science between CF3 three, three to, to 7 is pretty coherent. Well, at least 3 to 6. 7 may be slightly different. I mean, and we've been trying to make it coherent. Like, and we, 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 do, we are trying to sell essentially the story about you know, future spectroscopic facilities. Hello, uh, this is Haibo Yu from UC Riverside. I just want to follow the discussion on the dark matter physics aspect. Um, so even in, if you look at our executive summary, I think the second point or one of those points we kind of discuss, you know, the possibility that when we consider the uh, next generation facilities, uh, the dark matter physics should be considered as a, as, a, as a part of the mission, right, consideration. So of course, my understanding is that for say four is part of like, you know, dark energy and acceleration, but if we're gonna have a, like the, to make the case stronger, if we put it in the like a CF report. Um, so like, like if you, when you show a table like this, um, where we can like dark matter physics can, can get into the, the table and uh, to, maybe it's a hard to make a projection in the next two weeks, but from slightly longer term perspective, how would we work together to make it? Well, I, I feel like a table with dark matter in it is CF6. Um, but uh, what we say- And CF3, is, right, of course. Yeah, CF3, but then feeds, you know, one that has both us and dark matter is CF6. Um, but uh, so where we talk about other cosmological applications of these phase, stage five facilities, we start by saying the CF3 report talks about all the dark matter stuff. And uh, so you should go there. Uh, and we're gonna talk about the stuff that isn't dark matter, basically. Um, so we're, we tried, but, but there's, there's overlap in the small scale power spectrum sort of things where it's a little uh it's a little hard to divide <laughs> uh that uh, and but we, we we do we do sort of say you are the experts and uh but it's clearly compelling and important um other thoughts here David. okay just, just while we're veering into the bigger picture here which and this gets more into CF5 tomorrow also, but the, uh, the question of what we're doing about inflation in CF3, 4, 5, 6, 7, I guess. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, 4, 5, 6, 7, um, which is, I mean, I, I think we're looking at a decade or two where inflation cannot hide, right? Whether it's single field or multi-field. And that's a point that does not come across just reading the individual CF reports. 
Um, so I, I think that's something you know missing just in, in terms of does it show up in B modes or not? And my understanding at least is that it it can't hide. We are going to get there, and so that 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 really ought to be a driver coming out of the snow mass. I think. Hi, I'm Natalie Pawan from uh, Berkeley. Uh, regarding inflation, that's not at all uh, figured in the uh, in the figure of merit precisely. So we need to find another way of uh, uh, illustrating what we can do about inflation because the figure of merit doesn't tell the story about inflation. The primordial figure of merit. Well, I th well, I, th I think the way it was designed was supposed to, you know, the inflation reach in terms of this, in terms of FNL, should be fairly proportional to that figure of merit, right? I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, but um, but you're right that perhaps we could kind of make this connection cleaner, right? In particular, I'm not sure whether we have plots on FNL constraints. Maybe we do, maybe we don't, but it's something that we can trivially be imported from high volume uh, paper. Yeah, Jim and I were talking a little earlier about you know how it'd be nice to have something that shows up in L uh, and how we constrain it in, in some way. But you know, the, regarding inflation, the, there was inflation white paper submitted, but it was it's really long, right? So, but this was this was submitted to it was submitted to CF seven or maybe to even theory. Uh, so, in some sense, maybe oh you know, yeah yeah in theory frontier there's a big inflation paper. Um, which maybe is cross reference to us, but we that, that didn't take it as direct input. Um, but maybe this, I mean, in the text, we do blah, blabber about inflation. Perhaps we should kind of uh, put it out more cleanly. So this is, this is Alex Sterlich Wagner. Um, this discussion has got me thinking about this, uh, this figure that we've been seeing from CMBS4 and is showing up in the CF5 report that shows essentially constraints on different cosmological parameters. I'll post it to the to the Slack channel, but this does have wide field multi-object spectroscopy on it with FNL constraints. And you we might consider something similar for other dark energy parameters and showing growth and the staging. It does a really nice job of showing the staging between different current and future experiments. So I'll, I'll post that. Just wanted to make the point that figure of merit is probably the least useful plot in snow mass to show anybody because the high energy physicists, particle physicists, don't know anything about it. And so, if we're going to tell a story about inflation, we probably really want to write a narrative about inflation and get a cartoon plot in place. Well, did that put the figure of merit? You didn't no cosmology to 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 be able to read, but clearly it paid to this thing. It seems <laughs> uh, Steve Allen has a hands up online. Thanks. Yeah. Um, often when we're trying to motivate one of these really big projects, um, uh, we're looking for an order of magnitude improvement in, in something people know about and can understand. So with, with LSST, it was dark energy. With, with uh, uh, CMBS4, it was inflation. Is there something that we can point to here where and we clearly got an order of magnitude improvement and, and it's not hard to explain it? Yeah, I, so this is Ben first is replying to, to that question. I think this primordial figure of merit is partly showing that. If, if, it, if it's kind of advertised somewhat differently, I think it can definitely serve that point of showing what, whatever is hiding in the early universe um, would, would show up on in these kind of linear or, or mildly nonlinear scales that are counted by this figure of merit. And so if you can do better with that, you can do better with all that kind of primordial science. Um, and then briefly to kind of Anjay in regarding in regards to the inflation of one of the inflation my papers, I was one of the co-leads of the inflation theory and observations, my paper. Um, and so we, we submitted it to CF5 because we were asked to do that from, from their end, but assumed that it would be picked up by kind of all relevant CF, uh, Kind of groups. I'm happy. I mean, you you know where where to find it. 
but uh, and we, we do we did try to highlight various kinds of experiments, including um, large structure experiments of CA4 and how what what they can do to, to uh, benefit various uh, inflationary targets. I think that's exactly the sort of cross cross CF group connection I'd like to see here. So thank you. Uh, I mean, in terms of order of magnitude, I believe that FNL is something that allows an order of magnitude improvement in precision, or at least over current results. What the precision right now is six, I believe, is the constraint on FNL is the one single error bar. And depending on which facility you're talking about, it ranges between 0.2 and 0.5-ish, I think, in the future. Um, so I think that's the clearest backbone of a future spectroscopic survey in terms of that order of magnitude improvement as a direct observable that gets you. And it also allows you a big question of uh, resolving one field versus multi-field uh, inflation models. Can, can, can we say something uh, compelling there in, in the context of CMBS4 already being done? And CF4 is up, CMBS4 is up for evaluation at the SNOMAS, right? So we can't assume it. But you know, CMBS4 inflation, they, they focus on N effective and B modes, right? I mean, FNL is left to, to effectively uh, to, to us. So, 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 yeah. I mean, you can, you can then make complementarity story, blah, 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 blah. Um, uh, so however, looks, I'm also not okay. sure, I'm also not sure basically that. They will find like a very very big aggressive thing for one number only, right? Uh, so I think th th I think it's good to present. Look, and it will do FNL, but it will do this other thing and this other thing, this other thing. So so we've got a hand up online from Ke Fang. Oh hi, this is Ke Fang from CF Seven. I just wanted to confirm um, what Jeff said earlier that yes, there is also a H not tension discussion in the CF Seven report. We also have a figure about the. Um, different cosmic probes and uncertainties associated with with these kind of H naught measurements. Of course, we have a focus from the gravitational wave um, background and facilities, but we should definitely coordinate. I've seen a number of hands up. Uh, yeah. Hi, uh, John Roll from Case Western. Yeah, I, I'm a little confused about the title of this session versus the contents of the discussion of this session. Um, could somebody speak to that and whether the things that we're talking about here with FNL and this uh, primordial figure, America, should those really be showing up in a different uh, CF? So the title was given to us at the beginning of Snowmass. Um, as we started to have discussions, it was clear that the community input thought that uh, there's a lot of a lot of science that comes from the same projects, the, the things you would do to study cosmic acceleration do a lot of things at once um, through the same exact measurements. Um, and so although we definitely want to be talking about those cosmic acceleration pieces, those are the things that are probably, you know, most familiar to the community. They've heard of VAO before and things like that. But these other payoffs are actually where a lot of the science will come from these future facilities. Um, and we, we do want to make the case that we gain a, a widely constraining uh, portfolio of projects. Uh, but but uh, I think it goes deeper than that, right? To answer the, 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 the question in a different way, you know, so we, I mean, at some level, you have to interpret the way you want to interpret. We interpret modern, modern, modern universe title as basically experiments that are done at redshift below six. But of course, they're sensitive to stuff that is happening at very, very high redshifts. Uh, so that, that's why we're covering it here. But the, the lines between us and CF7 are sometimes thin. I mean, that's clear. Yes, yeah, CF7 seems to be kind of uh, closer to non canonical crazy shit. That's what I'm Other content? John? Hi, John Carlstrom. I had just this question of. Uh, if CMBS4 doesn't find B modes, then we'll see FNL, that, that inflation can't hide. I don't think that's true, is it? I mean, it's another probe, but if that were to be true, then that's a huge argument. We should just jump on it. We should put it front and center. So so we have Ben. Ben, can you comment on this argument? Because I've, I've, I've heard like arguments both ways. 
Is it true that we either see FNL or we see tensor modes? Because I thought you can actually see neither and neither, and then and then you are. I, I, I wish it was true, but um, I, th I think when we there, there are arguments that we, if, if nature is kind, then we could see sort of one or the other. But I mean, in, in principle, um, it could it could certainly hide to the below those levels. I mean, for our uh, like it, the, the floor is very low. If, if you talk about FNL equilateral, then there are very strong arguments to find something kind of around around one or so. Um, but so that that's that's different from FNL local, which a lot of people here are kind of mainly focusing on. Um, so it's it's kind of a long longer time scales than than this nomas, yes. So we should build up to that. Um, but I don't think this nomas probably. Yeah, so for the context, F and L equilateral, even these super duper future experiments, is still at the level, you know, 10 to 100, right? Is, is there a way of visually showing the parameter space of where we do and don't constrain or something like that? You know, or where, where theories of inflation fall in the space of R and F and L? Um, I, I just want to say I agree with Ben, but but what one could imagine trying to make some diagram that shows like single field going to multi field and energy scale like just like a like like two axes with something like that and 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 circling like FNL local up in the multi field case and uh, you know B modes on high energy scales or something like that just a, just a qualitative diagram. Yeah, that that sounds like something for the overall report that might be interesting. Um, okay, I want to just flip through quickly the other figures just to say, you know, show you what we can use comment on. I know we don't have time to discuss them, um, but just to, to preview for you. Um, we have this uh, depiction of measurements of the, the linear matter power spectrum, uh, along with uh, uh, projections for a couple of possible experiments. Um, so we have uh, a figure showing constraints on early dark energy models, uh, both from these stage five facilities and uh, the combination of DESI and 21 centimeter uh, intensity mapping. Um, we have a figure showing how LSST photosies get better with better training sets. Uh, better photosies give uh, stronger large scale structure constraints. They give stronger supernova constraints as well and cluster constraints from LSST. Um, we have tables showing how much time it take for different facilities to do that photo Z training spectroscopy. Uh, so these stage five facilities are really good for this. Also, uh, supernova host galaxy spectroscopy. Turns out things like DESI are very good for this. Uh, so they, the DESI LSST combination could be powerful. Um, I think this is the last figure. This is one showing uh, radial velocity precision versus time uh, and how it's gaining towards uh, the limit where we should measure redshift drift, which is a potentially powerful probe of cosmology. And uh, so we're advocating for sort of the, uh, the R&D to enable us to get down here as we get into the point of difference. Um, don't think we'd be there before that, but we do have the potential to get there. Um, and this, this slide I talked about. Um, so I know we've reached our time limit. So what are other ways to give us input? Number one, uh, send a message to Jim, Anja, and myself, uh, either through Slack or email. Uh, number two, happy to talk at breaks or lunch, I think 4 p.m. before the uh, uh, CEF session. Uh, we were talking about maybe meeting out at Red Square by the, uh, what's it called? This, the, this, the place where you registered that building. Kane, thank you. Uh, so uh, at four o'clock, if you want to have a chat outside, beautiful day for it. Uh, so you got comments here. Hello, <laughs> my name is Andrei Kapinska. I am from Fermilab, uh, and I don't work in the uh, cosmic frontier. Uh, this is why I was kind of waiting until you and the more working discussion. Uh, but uh, I want basically I have two parts to my question. Uh, one is that uh, there is, I see, dark energies in the title of the frontier. Uh, and the first part is that uh, I saw a statement, statements in the literature about the dark energy 
is an artifact of Pacific, it assumes uh, either that the spaces are the tropic. And that there is a strong, very strong observational evidence at, on the relevant scales, it is not. And if you allow for this, the dark energy goes away. Uh, so my, the first part of my question is what people in this room think about it. And if like, or did anyone here or not here, like how is this known in the community? And the second part is if I really like whatever in three years, you are convinced that dark energy is an artifact, whatever, you probably will want to study cosmic expansion using pretty much the same facilities as we are discussing here. Uh, but maybe like in the report for it to be more like time, future proof, uh, maybe uh, you can use wording which uses more of uh, cosmic expansion and less of dark energy. So no, so I, I have to strongly push against that. The, the, the evidence for star energy is very strong. It's come from very independent probe that the universe is accelerating. So what exactly dark energy is questionable, but you know, when, when people come tell you the universe might not be undergoing a straight expansion now, that's, it, it's like people telling you that atoms don't exist. I think, I think that's, that's out, out of the question now. We, we will get constraints on anisotropic dark energy through things like LSST supernovae, but uh, yeah. I think there's already, even with EES supernovae, it's, got to be, it's pretty similar in a lot of fields. <laughs> um, any other last thoughts, comments before we break for lunch? All right, thank you everyone. Thank you.